Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone, please, to put their mobile phones on silent? No apologies have been received, so we're going to move straight on to the agenda item one, which is uh, to consider Brexit and its implication on fisheries. It's going to be a roundtable discussion to, no to discuss the implications of the outcomes of the EU referendum for Scotland. This is the first in a series of sessions that the committee will undertake today, and we're particularly focusing today on fisheries. Now, what I propose to do is, as, as a roundtable discussion is to go round the table and ask everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, I would like to point out to those people that haven't been to a committee meeting before, the committee is supported by a clerking team, the official report, and the gentleman over there um, who, who, when I nod at him, will cut you off if you're speaking for too long. But what we'll do is we'll work round the table, if I may, with everyone introducing themselves. Uh, as far as the MSPs are concerned, maybe you could just introduce who you are and where you're from. So I'll start that off and we'll work to the left. My name's Edward Manton and I am a Conservative Regional MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Hi, I'm Peter Chapman. I am a Conservative <coughs> Regional MSP for the, the North East region and I am Shadow a, connective, a Rural Economy and Connectivity Shadow Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Bertie Armstrong, Chief Executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, uh, which is the trade association that looks after uh, a large portion of the catching sector in Scotland. I'm Mary Evans, and I'm an SNP MSP for Angus Northern Mairns. Uh, good morning. I'm Michael Bates. I'm the uh, group manager for the Scottish Seafood Association, based in Peterhead. We are a membership organisation representing the fish processing sector. Uh, Jamie Green, MSP, uh, Conservative uh, regional MSP for the West of Scotland and party spokesman on connectivity. Uh, morning, Scott Lansborough. I'm the chief executive of the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. That's the, that's the Salmon Farmers. Hey, Martin Vamp. Morning, John Finney, uh, Green MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Morning, Richard Lyle, SNP MSP for Uddingston and Belsong. Mike Rumbles, I'm the Liberal Democrat MSP for the North East of Scotland and spokesperson for everything on this committee. Uh, Robin Churchill, Professor Emeritus of International Law, University of Dundee. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, SNP member, Bamshire and Buchan Coast. Callum Duncan, I'm the Head of Conservation Scotland for the Marine Conservation Society. <coughs> Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands Labour MSP. Alastair Sinclair, National Coordinator for the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation. Uh, John Mason, I'm MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Gail Ross, SNP Constituency MSP for Caithness Sutherland and Ross and Deputy Convener of this committee. OK, thank you. We, we seem to have got round well. And I, and I hope that you, during the course of the discussions, and we've split this uh, discussion section up into themes, that you will all sort of try and look towards me so I can try and bring you in. The aim is to bring you all in, to make you feel included. So try and catch my eye. And, and what I would also urge is that if you feel you're going on for a bit of time, try and catch my eye as well, because I may want to stop you. Um, and that saves me calling you, calling you out and asking you to reduce what you're saying. So if, if you could do that, and, and, and it really it is meant to be a chance for everyone to have the opportunity to say something. So the first theme that we'd like to investigate as part of the committee is uh, the benefits of being part of the common fisheries policy and the EU. And uh, John, you, you had a question which you thought might stimulate discussion on that. Yeah, we could uh, try that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on fishing, so you can take it I'm a kind of layperson in this area. But I mean, I hear different things about the common fishery policy. I hear some people saying it's the worst thing that ever has been and we want totally rid of it, and there's nothing to learn from Europe. And I hear other people saying, if it wasn't for the common, fishery, common fisheries policy, there would be no fish left in the sea. So is it entirely good? Is it entirely bad? Or is there anything we can take from it? Who, who would like to... Uh, Bertie, I'm, I'm quite concerned about you. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
but I'm sure you're the right person to lead off. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gavina. I'll, I'll take your uh, comments about brevity and, and <laughs> keeping an eye on, uh, on, on control. Um, the, the CFP, uh, Europe is not composed of stupid people, and, and the CFP is not written by stupid people. It's, it's two problems, as far as to approach it from a slightly different angle. Its two problems are it, it allows common access, common grazing, uh, to our waters. That was the norm when we entered the EU. Everybody fished everywhere, aside from the territorial limits, and there were no quotas. Um, that was perpetuated and, and is, has created a great disadvantage. Uh, um, the second point is the difficulty of organizing uh, uh, this sort of thing between 28 going on 27 member states. It is, and I could produce evidence as long as your arm, it, it is, uh, the CFP operation is a uh, uncomfortable stumble towards compromise and, uh, and nothing happens quickly. Uh, uh, so there are much better ways of doing that. Having said that, it, 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 it of course, within those constraints and, and our enormous personal disadvantage in, in this land, um, it, it, it has, uh, at, at the same time that the CFP existed, uh, capacity has just about right-sized itself and uh, the fish stocks for the last uh, since the turn of the millennium, have been going very much in the right direction, uh, and, and fishing mortality, uh, which was far too high, is coming down. So, it's it's the wrong uh, it's it's the wrong process for us, and we'd be much better out of it. But on the other hand, uh, 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 the, the, it, it it has not been a complete disaster, recognizing that we are hugely disadvantaged, and that it, that it is a very cumbersome and wrong process to run a sea area in. Stuart, you wanted to come back on that. Um, I, th I think, speaking as a politician, that the, the CFP has presented some challenges in the way it makes decisions. Um, if the parties that were round the table making decisions were limited to those states that have fishing interests, it would have made rather more sense than we, we had a period, for example, in the not hugely distant past, uh, when the commissioner... Uh, was an Austrian, you know, a, a country without any maritime interests of any kind. Um, so I, th I think that has made the decision-making process unnecessarily cumbersome. It has exposed the decision-making process uh, to the political risk that countries who've no direct stake in fishing have used their influence in the decision-making around the common fisheries policy as a trade-off for entirely unrelated matters. And that has both slowed things down and led to suboptimal outcomes. So I think, you know, from a politician's point of view, uh, that would be one of the starting places uh, for, for, for saying that in its present form, the CFP is not fit for purpose. Mary, did you want to come back with a question? Uh, yeah, it was. It was just on some of the you talked about before we entered the CFP. And it was really just to get a bit more uh, information about historically what that position was like and how the fish stocks were doing at that time as well when it was just, a, well, essentially there was a, a, a free-for-all for people fishing in each other's waters yeah. and just to get a bit more information. In. Yeah, there's, a, there's an easily traceable story which can quickly be uh, scanned across. Um, um, in the beginning, everyone thought, to, to really uh, um, generalise, that, that the sea was a bottomless pit of resource uh, and that we should have at it with, with, uh, with the greatest of alacrity, which is roughly what happened. The war intervened uh, uh, and, and, and fishing lessened, so stocks uh, increased. There was a phenomenon known as the, and we have a subject matter expert in the, in the gallery here, there was, there was a phenomenon known as the Gadoid outburst, which, to, to cut a long story short again, uh, meant there was an awful lot of fish. In, in the northern continental shelf. So everybody had at it with a will under those circumstances of a basically a free-for-all. Uh, and the inevitable happened. Uh, and, and we had to, uh, we, we, we had to one way or another arrive at an arrangement. But by that stage, it was too late for us. The, the way the international community, again, to hugely generalize, uh, the way the international community went about this was to put somebody in charge, which was the coastal state in whose waters this resource lay. Too late for us. The coastal state for us was the uh, was the European uh, Union with all the problems that Stuart has just described of of, of vested interest. Mm -hmm. okay. Callum, you wanted to come in there, and then I'll come back to John. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Edward. Um, clearly, we we all want to get to healthy seas with sustainably managed stocks. That requires collaboration. 
that supports thriving coastal communities, that has to respect environmental and ecosystem limits. Um, so that, that's the important outcome from our perspective. Um, in terms of getting there, we mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are there's a lot of good uh, outcomes and articles within the common fisheries policy. So you know, let's not think about completely starting from scratch. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good in there. I mean, as as, as Bertie alluded to, um, re, you know, reform management has led to uh, and, and the industry coming on board and. The Scottish fleet, particularly taking some progressive measures, has got us to a place with the, the, the fishing capacity matching the opportunity. We've gone from 90% stocks being overexploited in 2005 to 47% now. Um, other good elements I'd like to point out was in the, the CFP are things like Article 4, an ecosystem based approach to fisheries management, an integrated approach to managing fishing within ecologically meaningful boundaries. And it's these sort of um, aspirations that we need to take forward. Article 17, uh, we, I'm sure we all support that in terms of setting transparent and objective criteria to meet environmental, social and economic uh, benefits. We'd like to see uh, end of wasteful discards. That's, there's, there's, there's maybe better ways to do that, but we all, we all agree that's a good thing. And probably world leading regulations to protect the deep sea, some of the most vulnerable ecosystems on Earth. So the deep sea access regime, uh, which finally came through in 2016, protecting vulnerable ecosystems deeper than 800 metres uh, and, and uh, some shallower than 400 as well. So there's a lot of hard work gone into uh, getting the elements of the CFP to deliver um, collaborative management within ecosystem limits. That's whatever our arrangements are. I think we can all agree that's where we want to get to. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's interesting, and maybe people will want to develop whether um, the conservation and and the work that are doing to uh, 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 to stop the over exploitation of fish species is being led by the EU or, or fishermen or both. Um, Robin, you want to come in and then uh, John wants to come back. If I... uh, thank you. Uh, I think one, it's worth bearing in mind that the common fisheries policy is not just about the catching side, but also about marketing, trade and uh, structural aid. But I assume the main interest today is on the catching side. Uh, to come back to the original question, I think it's probably fair to say that up until 2010 at least, uh, the common fisheries policy was a complete disaster in managing stocks. The Commission admitted it, that itself in a paper published in 2009 when it said that most stocks are being fished at unsustainable levels. Uh, and the reasons for that in brief are that uh, total allowable catches were set by politicians way above the limits recommended by scientists from the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, uh, there was often poor enforcement. Uh, there was a large amount of overcapacity in EU fleets. In other words, there was more, uh, more vessels and more catching power to catch the fish than was uh, justifiable on any economic scale. Uh, and it's taken a long time to try and reduce capacity. Um, there are some indications that since the common fisheries policy was reformed in 2013 that the management has improved. There seems to be a better correlation now between total allowable catches and scientific recommendations. Uh, John, did you want... Yeah, yeah. Was just on that kind of theme, and quotas were mentioned that before we were in the EU and the uh, common fisheries policy, there weren't quotas. And so I suppose, again, as a layperson, my fear would be if we're out of it, is there a danger it does become a free-for-all again and there's no control? Who would like to go on that? But Bertie, would you like to? Very briefly. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there is a fear of that. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't think that's, if we handle this properly, I don't think there's a possibility of that. Um, we've just come from a study visit to Norway, and, and, and their central top overriding priority is, is stock sustainability, because all other goods, all other good things uh, uh, fall from that. We should take a leaf firmly out of, out of, out of that book in, in retaining the good bits of the CFP that, that should be the central aim. So um, 
what was emphasized this morning at the seminar was, was the fish are actually in our EEZ, to cut a long story very short. They're zonally attached to our EEZ. So th there can't be a free-for-all. No, no other country can say, I'm just going to catch anyway, because they'd have to come here uh, uh, to catch anyway, again, to generalize a little. And, uh, and, and, and under international law, that, that, is, is, uh, that is our right and responsibility to regulate that. So there's, there's every possibility of getting this sustainably right uh, for the future. Okay, ready to For the record, can we just say EEZ is exclusive, so sorry, economic exclusive economic zone. zone? Is that correct? Yes, that's thanks. Perfect. Ready. I think I was just wanting to pull it back a wee bit to, you know, some of the things that Callum had talked about are surely things we could replicate um, if we were out of the EU, the kind of setting quotas and how we manage it. But I suppose what my question is, how do we then negotiate that with other people who have an interest? And Bertie was saying that all the fish are in our EZ. Is, uh, roughly, I mean, there's obviously we have interests out with that, that as well, people fishing out with that area. So I'm wondering, you know, where are the real differences about being part of this big family that manages it or being out there on our own? Right, I think that's a very important point, and we're going to sort of develop that a bit under theme three. So it, maybe, maybe if I could just part that just slightly at the moment um, and uh, see if we can c come back to the, the good and the bad, as it were, of, of the Peter. Sorry, Reda, we'll come. I'll, I'll bring you in on that one, Peter. I just, I just wanted to follow up a bit on what uh, Robin Churchill was saying about the, there was too much catching ability, you know, a few years back, and we've now got that into better balance and we've reduced capacity. Would you like to comment on where the, the vast bulk of the reduction in capacity took place? Because the feeling is that the, the vast reduction in capacity took place in Scotland rather than in other EU countries. Is that fair to say that? Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure. It's some time since I looked at the figures for reduction in capacity. But, um, I mean, one of the problems with capacity is that uh, if it's not only a case of reducing the number of vessels, it's a, it's a question of the catching power. So sometimes you reduce the number of vessels, but the vessels, the vessels that remain increase their catching capacity by having bigger engines, bigger nets, and so on. Uh, I mean, the, the Commission does publish figures on this, but whether yeah. they're very accurate, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, my, my, my focus is where, the, where the, the, the reduction in catching power took place, and the, the feeling is that it very much took place in the in, in UK in the UK fishing uh, fleet rather than elsewhere. I mean, I don't know if anybody else in there uh, can comment. And then I may be bring Bertie in and then Stuart wants to, I think, come. Robin, do you want, do you want to say anything? Oh, it's Callum, it's targeted Callum, very much at Spain and Portugal, yeah. but whether it's been very effective in relation to those two countries, I don't know. I, as I say, I haven't seen any recent figures. Yeah. Uh, sorry, before I do, Bertie, Callum indicated, and then if I may come to, come to you, Callum. Um, it was just to provide a little bit of <clears throat> uh, broader ecological context for this to, to, to emphasise that you know around 100 stocks are fished by UK, including Scottish boats, and by other nations. So obviously it's very complex. And uh, you know the, the other side of the uh, ecological equation, if you like, of the fish, a lot of the fish coming here, a lot of the fish that come in, into the EEZ waters around Scotland, as we heard this morning, such as mackerel, are spawning in the waters of other EU countries. So that's, again, just to emphasise that ecosystem approach, not to be just thinking about where the fish are to be caught, but where they spawn. And, and that's where that cross-border collaboration in whatever structure we have is absolutely key. Global management is, is important. Sorry, yeah. do you want to come back on that, Bertie? Maybe on the on who yeah. suffered the pain. I, I yes, fear I, I know where you're going. I, well, I think it was. It, it, there, there were certainly a great deal of sacrifices made here. And, and Robin's right about the equivalence of boat numbers is sometimes uh, uh, highly misleading. Um, the, 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 there, requ there is there requires to be some spare capacity. For instance, for the uh, the highly migratory species, which uh, uh, there are not many that, that that behave in the way that. Uh, uh, Callum has just described, a lot of them are much more localized than that. But um, in order to catch um, mackerel on their migration out in the northeast Atlantic, you need a big boat if you're, to, if you're not to kill yourself. Uh, uh, and and you, need, uh, you, you, you need catching capacity 
because we have a big quota in, 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 in normal terms. Um, so therefore, as long as it's profitable, a bit of overcapacity is not necessarily a bad thing, provided the regulatory regime takes charge of it. And here's the vital central point, that the fishermen understand that sustainability is in their best interests. And although they could catch more, they do not do so for two reasons. One, so that the market holds up, and two, so that they don't engage in a downward spiral to hell in a handcart. Stuart, do you want to come in? And then maybe we'll move on to uh, the, th the second theme that I'd like to look at. I, I was just going to make a fairly brief uh, historical point that even predates Bertie being at the SFF, but in the early 2000s, when there was a substantial decommissioning of the Scottish fleet, there was a huge amount of ill will created uh, at that time uh, because the EU was simultaneously uh, providing funding to the Spaniards to increase the size of their fleet. And to this very day, even though we've moved to a rather different environment, uh, that influences the thinking of uh, many of the, the people involved in the catching sector because the gross and demonstrable inequity of that essentially EU-driven intervention, uh, on the one hand, quote, killing our fleet, and on the other hand, building up the Spaniards, is still something that you will not escape getting a reference to in many conversations with fishermen in my area of the country. Okay, so I think we maybe leave that one there on, on the note that it hasn't all been perfect under the EU. Peter, Peter uh, is going to talk about, uh, would like to probe a little bit on this policy of how to untangle domestic policy from EU legislation. Mm, yeah, thanks, Edward. We all know, we'll, we've all dis discovered that fisheries policy is a, is a very complex area. Um, which possibly cannot be solved in its entirety by the Great Repeal Bill, which is, you know, about taking all laws from uh, back into uh, our hands in, in the UK. So, I mean, my question is, will a Great Repeal Bill work for fisheries and aquaculture? And, and uh, do the experts have any particular concerns of, about a Great Repeal Bill uh, in this region? Um, who, who'd like to go on that? I know, I mean, I'd quite like to bring in some of the aquaculture interests at, at some stage, so um, I, I sort of give you a warning that, that I'd like to just push on that. Maybe I'll start with, with, with Bertie again on that, just so. Uh, that, that, that's a, very, a more than relevant question. Um, if, if the Great Repeal Bill, the whole of the CFP, is, is embraced in, in UK law, then it frankly won't work because relative stability and the grand disadvantage will, will, will be perpetuated. Um, there are, uh, we've already discussed this with um, um, the, the relevant people in the UK government, and there are some, what be, I'm delighted to say a term has arisen, which is inoperabilities. <laughs> if you just did that, then it would be inoperable for, 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 uh, 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 um, for a number of reasons. There's much that can be embraced. We've gone through the common fisheries policy with a pen and lined out the bits that are inoperable. Um, much of it is operable, or some of it is operable, providing you take those big bits out. Uh, but there may need to be some new legislation, which, of course, is a bit of an uphill battle. There may need to be some new, uh, 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 new legislation for day one of, of, of Brexit. But we would see that as doable, we hope. Scott, uh, having given you warning, I mean, obviously you're a very important, and your industry is an important part of... Uh, uh, fish production for Scotland and the UK. Perhaps you'd like yes. to say something about what your views on that Well, are. specifically with the Great Repeal Bill, I, um, I, I really our concern would be regulatory equivalence. That's, that, that would be important to us. Our major competitor being Norway, who are in the EEA, and uh, they have regulatory uh, equivalence um, uh, with the EU. And we expect something similar uh, uh, once the Great Repeal Bill uh, is enacted, and our, I know the Cabinet Secretary uh, here has uh, expressed similar sentiments, and we, we don't really have any issue with that. I mean, we, we live with the environmental regulation we have now. Uh, occasionally we may think it may be over-precautionary. I'm sure Callum would have an, an alternative opinion to that, but nevertheless, it um, is world-class standards that we are see all seeking, and I think we, that's what we've established. So we don't see any dividend uh, coming from uh, repealing uh, regulation. We, we just don't envisage that at all. Uh, our main concern really is, is, is more uh, commercial than, than anything else. Okay, just, uh, just on that, just, I mean, on the basis uh, 
that uh, um, a lot of operators in Scotland also operate in Norway, presumably the standards would, would be fairly interchangeable. Is that an unfair assumption? Well, interchangeable is maybe not the right word. I mean, we, we, we operate to a code of good practice that's 540 compliance points within it, uh, which really is the, the framework for how we operate and how we farm. Uh, and although there, there's, if you like, as I said, regulatory equivalence, there's a different <coughs> interpretation in Norway to, uh, and, and the way uh, in environmental uh, regulation is enacted in Norway is somewhat different <coughs> to how it is here. So, you know, there are some parts of that model we would quite like. There are uh, parts probably of ours that they would quite like. But it, the overall framework is set by the EU and we uh, both operate within that framework. So there, there, there are some differences. Uh, equally, some of the differences arise on account of geography. I mean, the, you know, the, the coastline of Norway is quite considerably different to the coastline of Scotland. Sorry, just uh, uh, is it easier or, or less regulations in Norway to Scotland, or are they the same? It's, that, that's maybe too simplistic. In some instances, it, it could be regarded as um, more favourable with regard to incentivising different behaviours, I would say, uh, in Norway. And that's something that we're in continuous conversation with Marine Scotland about. Okay, John, you want to come that's in then, Stuart? What exactly you mean by regulatory equivalence? Because that's not a term I'm, I'm afraid I'm very familiar with. Um, <clears throat> well, basically, the regulatory framework we currently enjoy is really uh, comes from uh, has its origins in the European Union, and the um, regulation that's that SEPA basically uh, deploy in Scotland is based upon. Uh, the environmental standards that are that are established in, in the Euro European Union, and the and we have what we call EQS e environmental quality standards, which are invoked here to ensure that there's protection for the local environment um, and and also the the wide national environment, and we obviously have to abide by them, and we respect that, and and we're relatively comfortable with that just now, and we don't envisage that changing significantly um, once the Great Repeal Bill comes in. Callum, did you want to come in and then I'd like to bring Stuart in? Um, again, I would uh, focus on any particular Sorry, I thought I th a, a leg no, legislative solution. Um, the important thing is that in line with both Scottish Government and UK Government ambitions to be world leaders and in line with the global management we were talking about, we'd like to see uh, legislation uh, strengthened and, and even going beyond and uh, I've touched on some of the things we wouldn't want to see lost that are the best of the, of the CFP but there's also very good global uh, standards in terms of World Summit and Sustainable Development um, the, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea OSPAR uh, the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission all these um, global drivers have to be taken into account and the the, the other uh, key legal protections that are important are, are those that are delivered by a directive such as the marine strategy framework directive within which um, sustainable fisheries management would would contribute uh, and the, the birds and habitats directives world leading protection for important uh, marine areas for, for species and habitats. So it, it's absolutely key, whatever the constitutional legal outcome is, that all these protections are uh, strengthened and improved in order to meet uh, ambitions of all four nations. Stuart, do you want to come in? And uh, then I'd like to bring in Alistair. Uh, just a couple of things fairly briefly. On uh, salmon farming, I think just environmentally, given that Norway has very little tidal rise and fall, the environmental uh, opportunity for the tide to disperse waste material from farming is much less in Norway than in Scotland. Now, I make no comment about that, apart from saying, therefore, clearly, you need a different regulatory regime, simply because of that physical difference in the locations, just to choose but one example of the differences. So I, I, I don't think the same regulatory regime would work in the two jurisdictions. Uh, but let me just move on to the, 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 the real reason I put my finger up, uh, which was looking at 
domestic policy uh, following the Great Reform. I think we, we mustn't overlook the fact that we've also got to address the issue of domestic practice. And what I'm specifically concerned about is that I think the way in which we have to run enforcement will be different. Uh, we might need another fishery protection vessel because I think our enforcement response, uh, I can see, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, I just say in the debate, we've got to address that issue because it's not just about changing the law, it's about changing what we do as well. And our two fishery protection vessels are spread pretty thin. And if we've got more vessels out there, of our vessels out there, we're going to have a different enforcement regime we need to address. No answers, only a question. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe the technology that's coming on the stream will make, make that easier. But uh, Alistair, you wanted to, to come in? Yeah, I well, think. I, I'm here today representing creel and dive fishing operations around the coastline of Scotland. And on the west coast in particular, where many of the rural communities rely on their catches, to provide the rural communities with benefits that flow through the community. Our biggest concern is not really Europe because we have exclusive access out to six miles and most of our membership works within that six mile area. And the biggest darkness on our doorstep at the current time is the salmon farming industry which are using copious amounts of chemical pollutants to treat sea lice. And th those chemicals are responsible for reducing crustacea to form shell. We have to seek guarantees from the, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation that they clean up their act. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 I'm going to try and defuse this slightly and just say that, that I understand your concerns and I understand that there'll be concerns on both sides. And, and maybe this is something that we can look at uh, beyond the... Uh, Brexit and, and the European Union, no. and it's something that Scotland needs to look at. Mike, can I bring you in? I take your point there. Too. I, I'd like to particularly ask Scott this about regulatory regimes. Um, when we come out of the European Union, and contrary to the view just expressed by Stuart, I, I, I would imagine. Correct me if I'm wrong. I imagine for your exports to the European Union, you would need to have the same regulatory standards that the rest of the European Union operate within? In other words, to keep market share and perhaps increase market share over there? Yeah, I think that, that was the point I was trying to make earlier on, mm -hmm. is that the, the overall environmental regulatory framework, uh, we, we operate under uh, similar regimes. The interpretation is different. SEPA interprets it in a different way to uh, the way the authorities in Norway do. And Stuart was right that obviously they have less tidal exchange in, off the Norwegian coast, but they're much deeper coastline than we have as well. So that's to their advantage uh, with regard to sedimentary control. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, we're not comparing apples with, thorn, with apples as it were, as with oranges, uh, with regard to the different environment we operate in. Having said that, the overall or overarching environmental re regulatory framework uh, comes from the European Union. And, and is that a similar standard? Yeah, for I mean, we, want, we yeah. want to be, like Callum mentions world-class standards, we want to be world-class. Yeah. I mean, that, we export to 65 countries around the world. We can't do that if we're not world-class standards in our production. Thank you. Can, but, Michael, I, I'm wondering if you want to come in at all on, on, on keeping the standards the same as, as Europe and, and, and uh, that. I mean, I can bring Peter in first. Uh, that, sorry, I'm rather bouncing you for an answer. So maybe Peter, come in first, and then I can maybe come back to you on that. Well, I mean, I've got a specific question, uh, convener. It, it, it's, it, it's in this theme, and, and one of the themes that we're, we're, the, the industry is struggling with at the moment is, is the landing obligation. Uh, issue and, and that falls in here as well and we know that there are, there are issues nobody wants to see good fish go over the side but there are issues with with the uh, tied in with quota and choke species and all that stuff and i wonder uh, if we're designing a new regime post brexit how that uh, particular issue could be could be framed in a more suitable manner for the fishing community to, to live with Peter, you're not going to you're not going to enjoy me for this. I, I'm going to hold I'm going to hold that over to theme five, which I think is what elements of e EU policy would you like to go? Because I, I think that the very issue of um, uh, throwing dead fish over the side no, has okay. been a, has been a very difficult thing, and I'd like to develop that under theme five, and I'll certainly bring you in with the same question. Okay. Um, Michael, did you did you have a comment you wanted to make about trying to to keep the integration with Europe and the produce going to Europe? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Edward. We are 
very similar minded to, to the salmon uh, industry, that the standards that we have um, <clears throat> are needed to be maintained because of our successful export industry as well. Um, we have many standards within the country here. Um, we have salsa, BRC, um, and there, those standards are recognised throughout Europe, and a lot of people own Europe are asking for suppliers to have those standards in place. So we would, um, again, continue with those standards and, if possible, um, welcome cha any changes to it. But we're meeting a lot of what is going in place already and um, <coughs> we don't have any issues with, with, with the compliance of it. Um, our issue would be that, again, interpretation of the standards is different in Europe than it is here, um, but we interpret it the way that our country wants it to be interpreted, and it meets uh, the standards required abroad. So again, we are successful in exporting our fish because of the way that we handle it and look after it. Okay, John, John, you want to come in? Thank you, Convener. Yeah, it was to pick up a point that Mr Sinclair said, that I, I know you wish to move on from, we are talking about the Great Repeal Bill, yeah. but of course it, there's the potential there for replacement, and I wonder if Mr Sinclair saw that an opportunity with the Great Repeal Bill to put some more robust <coughs> laws in place, because a lot of people share the concerns that you articulated there. have to, because we're at the, the stage now where there are things appearing in the press that are really questionable as to the, the behaviour of SEPA and others. And the communities from where our fishermen operate are seeing, for example, <coughs> fish farm applications to be placed within marine protected areas. Well, that makes a nonsense of a marine, marine protected areas. And they don't want to see marine protected areas spoiled in such a manner. Because we have anecdotal and there is other genuine proof that some of the chemicals that these, these guys have been using in the past are detrimental to the sea floor. And anything that's on the sea floor is going to be affected by chemical and that in turn will affect the, the, the guys that are out there fishing for castracia, etc. We have enough problems with microbeads and etc etc without getting into the problems that the salmon farming industry might place upon us. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, just before just before I bring you in, can I, can I ask Callum to come in? And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance to come back, and, and maybe then we can move on to the next subject. Callum, sorry. Yeah, small point in, in response to, to John uh, taking the point that MPA uh, fisheries and MPA compliance might come under a future theme, but relevant to this theme, uh, it, it was to emphasise that there's a commitment in the programme of government to an inshore fisheries bill, and. Uh, the, the inshore is still to be defined, whether that's six or twelve or what have you. So there may be overlap with CFP or CFP two or what have you. Um, but it's just to take the opportunity to emphasise that, regardless of how we in Scotland and across the UK choose to manage uh, fishing, particularly in those offshore waters, that w we can't let that opportunity for the to improve the inshore management through the inshore fishing bill be lost because inshore fishing has been a bit of a Cinderella, it seems to me, in terms of um, sustainability and, and uh, uh, an overlooked area. So we, we welcome that bill coming forward. I'm going to let uh, Scott say a final comment before we move perhaps on to the next. Thing. Thank you, uh, Edward. I, I mean, I, 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 I take your point, uh, John Finney, uh, that we're here to talk about the Great Repeal Bill at this point and then other uh, aspects of Brexit. I didn't expect the salmon farming industry to be attacked when I got here this morning. And I think uh, some of the references to recent media comments are uh, potentially um, inflammatory because some of that really, uh, I feel, has been written in a, in a manner as if we're hiding something. All of, the, all of the data that's come out in the media recently is published. It's actually in the public domain. And we're, con we're complying with SEPA regulation. Now, if people want that changed, fair enough. Let's go through a proper lobbying process and discussion about that. But let's not just hang salmon farming in the court of public opinion, uh, which is primarily being uh, hijacked by uh, campaigners. Scott, I, I don't think salmon farming is being attacked. I think what, what, what's interesting between this, this session is we're talking, or, or this particular theme, is that we're talking on whether it's possible to untangle 
legislation. And, and what I think the committee is hearing is there's an op first of all, there should be no reining back on, on, on the standards that are being set by Europe if we're still to be able to maintain within Europe. And there is a real opportunity to move the standards forward. That is my understanding of what's been said, and certainly what, what we've heard from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation is, is, is that it's, it's not beyond the wit of man with negotiation to make this work. And I think, I think that's where I'd like to leave this. And, and, and I would urge people that actually what we are trying to do is, is see a way forward and, and improving everything that we can, um, and I think that's important. So what I... What I we, we said when, in fact, I stopped radar, I think we, we were talking about um, access to UK waters and quotas. And, and Rhoda, would you like just to, to, to rephrase your question, to bring it in now, uh, about what will happen? Uh, is it going to be a free-for-all? Um, I, I guess my, my question was slightly going on the first theme and um, on, on that theme, in that what is in the, the common fisheries policy? that we would want to retain and what, by coming out of it, where are the freedoms in that? And, that, and then leading on from that, how do we police that? Because how much of it is impacted by the common fisheries policy and how much not? OK, so does, does uh, Bertie want to come in? And I'd ask perhaps if, if, if we can think about this whole thing of access to, to the waters, um, not only the, the uh, 0 to 12 miles, but the 12 miles to 200 miles, because I think that's important. But certainly everyone can come in if I can get you all in. Bertie, you want to start, and Thank you I'll keep my eyes on. Mike wants Mike want to come in as well. So, but. If I may say, um, Rona has just put her finger on the, on, on, on the centre of the whole thing. The thing that's changed, uh, that will change on Brexit, is governance of, uh, of the uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, radically and wildly um, in, in, into the model already adopted around the world for coastal states, capital letters with a specific meaning that you have the rights and responsibilities uh, from our present shared uh, access, common <coughs> grazing, we've been dismissing it as. Uh, that's, that's the big bit. So it's a completely relevant question about what about access? Well, the, the answer to that is access to those waters is, is, in, the, is in the gift of the um, coastal state, much as Norway, Iceland, Faroes uh, um, um, do that. So it would be up to the coastal state to decide who came in. The setting of opportunity is absolutely central to this because how much fish can be caught, where and by whom, is the centre of sustainability. It, it either works or it doesn't. Uh, there, there already is, and I'm delighted to say, and it didn't quite come out in the seminar for those who attended it this morning, there already is, is, is a template for that known as coastal states, capital letters, where, where the relevant coastal states with fish in their EEZs uh, get together and, and thrash out how much of, of, of what can be caught where. Uh, it's a well-trodden path. It is much less politicised than, than the, the common fisheries policy because there's a cage in, uh, in, in, the, in the common fisheries policy with all the EU fishing nations in it. And they try and influence what the, in, the individual negotiator will then do in coastal states. It's much more direct, taking Norway as an example, uh, where they negotiate simply on their own behalf. They have, to use a phrase that you've heard before, have a seat at the top table, and that would be us. And who was in that seat would depend very much on what species. It would be a different set of people typically Marine Scotland uh, uh, officials, if you were talking about mackerel or herring, the grand migratory species. If you want to talk about channel cod, um, there's, there is no coastal state uh, arrangement for that, but there'd have to be. And I would imagine it would be DEFRA officials, and we wouldn't care as long as no Scottish fish was swapped for channel cod. But that's, that's, that's another story. So there, the, the, there is a process out there the, uh, where, where the principle of sovereignty, rights and responsibilities for the coastal state undertaken by us uh, and, and for us to then at last be able to negotiate uh, for advantage of the coastal state the same way as everybody else does. Okay. Mike, you wanted to make a comment. Um, on this very issue, uh, common fisheries policy and international law, um, at the seminar this morning, it came as a surprise to me, uh, having looked at this for, for, for years, it came as a surprise to me this morning, that we were told one quarter uh, within the Scottish exclusive economic zone of the UK's zone, one quarter of the fish in both quantity and value um, are fished by the EU states other than the UK. 
and one quarter are fished by non-EU states. So when I was under the impression that if we came out of the European Union, we'd be in charge of our own affairs, um, at the seminar this morning, it came to me, if I've interpreted it correctly, this is why I'm asking the question, that actually there are other obligations under international law that we have to adhere to. So is it, is it, what my question is framed basically is, is it a fallacy that when we come out of the European Union, um, the, you know, all this EU fishing capacity will be freed up for British and Scottish vessels? That's the key issue as far as I can see. I'll let Bertie come in, but briefly if I may, because I'd like to bring Robin in and, and yeah. in due course Callum. So. Robin will, without a shadow of a doubt, explain this lucidly, but uh, uh, the answer to that is yes. The, the, the non-EU fishing that happens, uh, a, a, an amount of fish is given to Norway, let's use Norway as an example, an amount of fish is given to Norway uh, uh, at the end of, of the EU-Norway ag uh, uh, agreements in exchange for other fish. Our problem in Scotland is that we are a, a big net contributor to the tune of 110,000 tonnes of blue whiting. Uh, into this swap, which Norway receives gratefully and catches, and then you get a load of stuff back, which goes not none of it to Scotland, most most of it elsewhere. So that inequity and, and disadvantage would be would 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 be fixed at a stroke. There may well be still 25% of the of, uh, of of the fish taken from European uh, from our waters fished in in non EU, EU hands, but we'd get a much better deal. Than, than, than we present, presently get. The essence, the central essential point is that sovereignty and control uh, uh, would fall to the, the coastal state, and you can make arrangements on that basis. And so the very short answer is yes. A, a short answer, but yeah. And, and sorry, <laughs> Robin, if, if, if I could bring you in, and then if I could bring in Stuart. Thank you. If I might just add uh, one or two little amplifications and qualifications on what Bertie has said. Uh, the, the basic starting position in international law is that a coastal state has sovereign rights over the living resources of its EEZ. Uh, the coastal state is not obliged to admit any other state to fish for those resources unless there is a surplus. In other words, if the allowable catch is greater than the fish catching capacity of the coastal state, then... Uh, the Law of the Sea Convention says that uh, other states must be given access to the surplus. But even after that, the coastal state has a complete discretion as to which states are given access, with the exception of landlocked and geographically disadvantaged states, but that's not relevant in, in the UK context. Um, however, there are, there are two or three things which um, mean, I think, that we, th that strict principle won't necessarily apply. Uh, the first is that uh, most of the stocks in the North Sea are shared stocks. Uh, that is to say that they, at the moment they're shared between the EU and Norway. Uh, Post-Brexit we would then need a, some trilateral arrangement, EU, UK and Norway. Uh, and then a, a, a lot depends on negotiation about uh, uh, allocation and... Um, uh, swaps and so on that Bertie's mentioned. I would say just one thing about allocation, and that is that uh, The Guardian a few weeks ago published what was described as a, leak, a leaked paper from the European Parliament, where the European Parliament was saying that the principle of relative stability, which is what applies, is the allocation key at the moment, should continue post-Brexit. Uh, and that seems to me to be unacceptable. Uh, the, the EU has said very strongly in recent weeks that the UK, if it comes out of the EU, cannot enjoy the benefits of membership. And to, it seems to me that principle cuts both ways, so that EU states and fishing states cannot enjoy the benefits that they have at the moment under the EU. Uh, and the basic, basic principle of allocation in the North Sea between Norway and the UK is a principle known as zonal attachment which is that it's the proportion of the catch, the proportion of mature fish in each uh, party's zone which determines, broadly speaking, the, the, the uh, division of the quota. Uh, so I think we would, should strongly hold out for that principle and resist any attempt to continue <coughs> rel relative stability. Just one, sorry, I've gone on rather at length, but just one other brief point to, to bear in mind, and that is that uh, the EU in the past has 
when negotiating trade arrangements had a trade-off between uh, greater access to the EU market and greater access for EU vessels to fishing grounds. This happened with Norway, uh, where there is no free trade in fish in principle under the European Economic Area. Uh, but Norway was given greater access to the EU market. But in return, Norway had to give the EU greater access for EU vessels to its waters. So, you know, I think we need to be aware in the negotiations that will be taking place that the EU may try to play this card. Of course, and I think the point was made at the, the uh, briefing this morning that giving access doesn't mean you're necessarily going to catch more fish. Um, it's giving access to the areas where there are fish. Stuart, do uh, you want to come in? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Robin has rather helpfully answered many of the questions I was going to ask, but I have one residual little question, um, and, and that simply is whether it, uh, and I'm not sure it's covered by any other heading in our proposed scheme of discussion, um, just whether it would be perfectly uh, legal for us to uh, abolish the existing quotas and replace them. I'm not proposing this, I hasten to add, before the price is put on my head, um, but whether it would be perfectly legal for us to do that and replace it with a different way of um, controlling, managing and allocating access rights. And, and I think I'm probably directing that just back to Rob. If you want to um, put your head in the firing line on quotas, uh, I'm... Well, yes, very briefly. I, it, the UK will be responsible for management of the 200-mile zone. If it wants to operate with total allowable catches and quotas, it could do that. But if it wanted to replace it with a form of effort limitation, you know, so many vessels can fish in these areas at such times. I mean, that, that's also a possibility. So we would have a free choice, in other words, as to the type of management measure we adopted. Well, Callum, do you want to come in on that, Bertie? I'm just to, I, I, I've, I've logged it, but I want to try and work around the table. Callum, do you want to come in on that? Uh, I mean, to, to respond to the, the, the question that Rhoda put about what to want to retain and what the freedoms, I think we'd, to consolidate what I was saying earlier, we'd like to retain commitment to the, an ecosystem-based approach to management, um, including appropriate measures to uh, address discards. There needs to be a pro precautionary approach hard hardwired in there. I would lead to wish to retain deep sea regulations. Uh, the principles enshrined by Article 17 in terms of, and this relates to the point about effective monitoring and management and so on, transparent objectives for environment, social um, and economic criteria. We'd integration with these, these overarching uh, frameworks, Marine Strategy Framework Directive, Habitat Spurts Directives, um, and retain a, a regionalised, eco-region approach to management. As I mentioned, lots of straggling stocks, straddling stocks and, and collaborations uh, necessary. <coughs> we we have the freedom to improve. Uh, so there's a in the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, the United Nations Convention on the Sea, the UN Fish Stock Agreement. The, it's the UN, it, it's the EU that's party to those. So um, it, in the in the absence of the CFP, it's not a free for all. So the, the, there needs to be a sensible sort of four nation approach to. Uh, negotiating with all those um, international frameworks to get sustainable ecosystem-based outcomes. A, a big part of the improvement I think that's needed is effective spatial measures, not just in relation to MPAs and SACs, but in terms of protecting important uh, uh, critical fish habitat for spawning grounds, for example, and breeding grounds. Um, and the, in terms of that wider context, the, the marine atlas uh, you know, does highlight the, the concerns about wider ecosystem health. So we shouldn't just focus on stocks. So there's a lot of concerns about wider seabed and ecosystem health. Uh, that uh, the improvement to spatial management of fishing could, could also help to address, in, in addition to, you know, improved stock management and, uh, and these other measures. And improved management can come about through full documentation, which is maybe something that we can get onto later. Um, I'm, I'm your shopping basket of things that you're <laughs> asking for may be overflowing. Okay. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, I, could, I could go to Bertie and just ask him to, uh, to, to make a comment on that. And then I'd like to just come back to, to Creeling. And, 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 and what I would like to just to prompt you on, Alistair, is, is, is if you see any threats from, from uh, other boats from other countries to Creeling in, in, in Scottish waters. But maybe you can answer that very quickly, Bertie. Callum's sh shopping list um, um, and, and, and uh, Robin's uh, um, small diversion into potential management measures. There's, there's no reason in God's earth why all of this can't be embraced with alacrity. Uh, uh, the, the good bits of the CFP 
the um, uh, focus on sustainability uh, um, and, and the freedom to use any method. I'll have to say uh, uh, an effort management only one is, is a, something of an untried system. We're unlikely to go to straight to that. But uh, um, all this is entirely possible because uh, we, uh, once we're out of the cage, of the CFP, we can do all of this and better. And we start from a good position uh, because we're entirely compliant right now uh, uh, with everything, and, and we can move forward from there. Alice, did you want to? Do you see any threats to creelers from 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 coming away from? Europe? I really don't think so. It would be too far to travel to, to make it viable. So, so there's no. It's it from your industry's point of view. I don't think we have any great concerns there. We have vessels that come from Guernsey, super crabbers, etc that come and take lobster and brown crab yeah. from stock. Uh, and they don't have any real impact on local fisheries. They might have in discrete <coughs> areas, but the discrete areas where these vessels fish are generally areas where a smaller boat can't fish, okay. you know, further out to sea. OK, well, if, if everyone's happy with that, I, I may move on to the next theme, which is access to funding, expertise, labour and resources. And I think John was going to, Finney was going to lead us off with a, a question on that. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Convener. And uh, it was with reference to the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund and uh, the, the sum of money that comes to Scotland uh, to support sustainable fishing and help coastal communities. And that's 44% of the, the UK fund. Um, and um, this may be particularly um, important for the fish processing sector. So the question is, will the UK and Scotland lose access to funding, expertise and resources that are particularly important for fisheries and uh, aquaculture, and its scientific expertise is perhaps one that we're keen to understand. It's a very good question. I, but can I just say that I, I would like to hear from Michael and, and Scott on that, because I think it will affect your industry as well. But if we start with Bertie and work that way, and then I'll, I'll work up this way. For the okay. catching sector, it's quite simple. Um, um, uh, the, the, the amount of, uh, of funding we receive from the EMFF is, is, is approximately, now uh, Ian will put me right and shout if this is wrong, it's, a, it's about 1% of first sale and landing. We are not an industry that depends on subsidies at all. In fact, it would be a distortion if we were. When there's a fund available, you grab it. And we do with some enthusiasm. If it's not there, it's not going to kill us, and we do not wish to develop into an industry that depends on funding. So uh, the, the last point, the very short point to make, is that is the UK, as a net funder, all things being equal, and I know life is more, more complicated than this, if, 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 if we give in more than we get, then surely it is not beyond the wit of man to support everything that is supported by, 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 by funds if those arguments stand up. Uh, by themselves. I think, Bertie, uh, John, well, part of John's question was also to do with labour. Was right. that right? Well, I, I hadn't come on to that, but of course, an important element of, of the, okay. the present situation is the free movement of labour. It's something that's very important to people, and the implications of any alteration to that situation yeah. we'd like to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, without a doubt, and uh, Michael, of course, will speak for the processing industry, there, there, there is some uh, EU. Uh, labour in the catching sector. Not a lot, to be honest. Um, I, I'm seized with this thought. What, what country would not supply itself with labour that it requires? There's a difference between free movement of all Europeans under, under the, one of the four freedoms in the, in, in the single market and a country like the UK uh, um, allowing people in to do jobs that it wants people to do. I, 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 I can't see that this is an, an unjumpable hurdle. Mari, before we move on, you indicated you want to add something to the... Well, this that, was, that was actually <clears throat> going to be my specific question, was related to the, the free movement of labour and exactly how important that is. Because, uh, I take your point, you see it's not a, a hurdle, but I think we've talked about that in some other areas and some other debates, that fair enough, we have a labour force here that, and, and a section of that, that that could be working, but obviously it depends where you are in the country. It's not all concentrated in one place, and it, it is just really the impact of the free movement of people and I imagine that will be, uh, from the process inside, that will have a big impact. Michael, would you like to, to, to talk on that? Yes. Thank you, uh, Edward. Certainly our uh, sector relies heavily on um, nationals from other EU countries <laughs> and there's no question that um, you know, we couldn't survive without them. Um, our own um, workforce no longer sees the fish processing sector as a, um, a viable, uh, lucrative uh, area to work in since uh, 
basically since oil came on board and started uh, pushing up wages and pinching um, you know, workers and it became a more attractive industry to go to. So we, we would uh, certainly like all um, foreign workers, for want of a better description, that are currently working in, in the country to, to be allowed to stay here. And um, we rely on that quite heavily because I, I can't see how we are going to be able to change the perception of um, youngsters that our industry is a career industry and is worth coming into without being able to offer huge wages to compete with uh, other industries. So we we really need these people to stay here and to be able to to come here and add to it as our sector will grow. You know, there's a lot of businesses keen to expand just now, but the uncertainty of Brexit is holding back investment. And once uh, the uncertainty becomes uh, clearer and everybody knows what we're faced with and how we're going to progress, um, there'll be a lot of companies ready to invest in the future, but they'll need staff. Okay. I think Mary wants to just yeah. come back and develop that a, a wee bit. point, really, that'll be uh, quick. And it was really just to, uh, do you have a figure on or a percentage of how much your the workforce across processing is, uh, you know, it comes from EU, how many EU migrants you have in the industry as a whole? Difficult to, to to give you a figure, but um, if I if I take the companies I know of in the North East, which are obviously predominantly Aberdeen and Peterhead, um, you're finding in most companies as little as 20% are uh, home uh, staff, you know, local people. Um, there's a huge majority of uh, EU nationals working in our industry. Certainly over 60%, mm -hmm. well over. Um, but before we move on to Scott, I, I think uh, Stuart had a question just on that. It's just a wee financial one uh, for the processing industry. With the, the current limit of uh, €30,000 support over, I think, three years, I never quite remember, yeah, three years, um, the, essentially the, the processing industry is not a big recipient either as the catching industry of European funds. The, the, the European Maritime and Fisheries uh, Fund is essentially an infrastructure fund that supports communities and is usefully, I would suggest, uh, supporting uh, harbours in their wider exploitation of opportunities, not just in, in fishing. So perhaps I, I'm, I'm correct, I hope, in saying that the processing industry is similarly pretty detached from EU financial support. Yes, really Stuart, unfortunately, me. you're correct. Yeah, we you. are very detached from it, yeah. Scott, do you want to, to come in and tell us a little bit about what your uh, industry? Thanks very much. Um, I think just to reiterate what Stuart said, uh, aquaculture is similar uh, to what Bertie said and, and Michael. Uh, we don't enjoy a lot of EMFF support. We do apply for match funding for one or two things from time to time, but it doesn't run to tens of millions. It runs to maybe one or two per annum, uh, which is good. I mean, it's not to be sniffed at, but it's not significant and it's it's not uh, crucial to our future well-being as, as an industry. So it's it's something that I, I don't I wouldn't put up as a, a red line issue, if you like, for us uh, in the future. Um, Nevertheless, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's always helpful. Um, we, we do have a lot of uh, money going into from the higher education uh, funding into uh, innovation centres, which uh, the Scottish Government established a few years ago, and we are looking forward to some dividend from that in the, in the near future. So, uh, and I think we'll see some significant change in our um, management of, of the welfare of our fish and, uh, through that, and that's really the main purpose for it being established. So it'll take time, but it, we, we're definitely making progress in that score. So I think that maybe will help one or two um, frustrations, if you like, that we've heard today with regard to salmon farming. Um, just uh, on the point of um, uh, uh, EU migrant labour, um, we, we estimate that um, in our primary and secondary production for salmon, and, and as you can imagine, farmed salmon is the one guaranteed fish that goes into the processing plants every day. And that was a point made at an SNP conference a couple of years ago by a delegate. That's the fish that does happen to arrive every day in a processing plant. And we reckon that's about 8,000 people from the EU 
uh, involved in, in processing. This proportion of your overall? Well, uh, I mean, I can't speak for the, the processing sector, but as far as farming is concerned, we're, we're not a labour-intensive industry. We employ about 2,500 people. Um, um, uh, sorry, just to develop that, uh, yeah. can you give a percentage of those 2,500 people? Very small, um, okay. like 10 per cent. Yeah, sorry, John, you want to yeah, It was just one point, and, and maybe the, the contributors are, are going to come to it, but I also asked uh, about the potential loss of scientific expertise. A lot of academia shares experience. I mean, it's the same water. It's uh, what we've heard in the forest industry about shared uh, expertise. Is there any concerns that uh, the panel have about loss of scientific expertise? Nick? Maybe Callum could come in on that, and I, I don't know, Robin, do you have a, a view? But Callum, maybe you could just come on scientific experience. Do you think that's going to be a loss? Um, I, I'm not closest enough to uh, the funding structures, but obviously I can speak to the principle of that there needs to be adequate resources to support sound science because all, all this ecosystem-based management of fisheries stocks and, and wider management decisions including on aquaculture needs to, to be based on good science but also the precautionary principle applies when when uh, data is lacking um, I, I mean I would like to say something about the incentives as well in relation to the actual fleet very quickly, very quickly. Um, and it's it's important whatever the sort of EMF equivalence is it's allocated according to need and that that these incentives encourage sustainable practice so we get a race to the top so that we're encouraging um, improved gear improved gear selectivity again things I'm sure everybody around the room can agree with uh, and that can lead uh, can uh, you know encouraged improved spatial management as well in terms of temporal and other uh, spatial areas um, so you know we, we we need to have financial incentives for the industry to encourage the sustainable practice we want to see that will then ha which is good business sense as well because you then have uh, a more sustainable product which is ha which is higher value conceivably lower environmental impact or ideally lower environmental impact and that uh, is the, the sort of market um, the sort of vision Scotland would want to project to the market uh, domestically and globally I'm sure um, and resources are also important for, for monitoring and compliance, of course. Um, I'm, I'm assuming if, you, if any of the panel members aren't looking at me, they, they definitely don't want to come in, and, and I will have to force them to come in. Um, I think, Scott, you want to come back, and I would like to ask Alistair just a wee bit about resources and labour as far as EU and krill fishermen are concerned. Sorry, it's Scott. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I, I don't, I don't have the figures, but it's a, it's a good question from John, uh, and I think we need to be aware that uh, there, uh, there's a lot of higher education support uh, coming from EF, EMFF, in particular with regard to our industry, uh, the Institute of Aquaculture, at the University of Stirling, which is regarded as a world-class edu educational and research establishment in the world of aquaculture, and uh, you know, I'm I'm aware that they have some serious concerns regarding uh, reduced funding. Okay. Alistair, do you want, uh, as far as creel fishermen concerned, grants from the EU or labour from the EU, is, is there a contribution or is there's, there... There's no great appetite from within the creel industry to actually go out and seek funding from the EMFF because the creel industry, like the mobile industry, is a here and now business. The boats can be repaired and sorted in a couple of days and bang, they're off to sea again. Yeah. And fi form filling is, is a very difficult thing to get creel fishermen to do. It's hard enough to get them to fill in their landing sheets on a weekly basis, never mind a long convoluted form for EMF funding. Um, Bertie, do you want to come back in on any of those? The, the scientific, <coughs> scientific support is exceedingly important. Uh, um, it, it, from uh, the International uh, Council for the Exploration of the Seas, the recognised international body, a lot of data leaves us, and there's great assistance from the EU for that data to be provided. That needs to be replaced. Uh, this, along the same lines, there's money there to do that, but, there, but that needs to be thought of. We cannot possibly have a degradation of stock assessments as a result of, uh, of, of uh, any, anything we do. John, do you want to follow any of them? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if everyone's happy, we may move, move on to that theme. And uh, the next one is uh, on what elements of the EU policy members of the panel are keen to see go. Um, I think Jamie's got a specific question. Um, 
and Callum was very adept at filling up a shopping basket. If I, it helps the committee if, if you can focus on a couple of issues, uh, if that's what Jamie's going to ask you. But Jamie, perhaps you could lead off. Thank you, Gavina. I think you've just asked the question for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's but, me put in my place, and you'll never get another question, But if I may, just, just for the benefit of being on the camera, I'll, uh, I'll say a few words. <laughs> um, I think one, it's fascinating listening to this conversation. I've been quietly listening in the corner here, but I think there generally seems to be consensus that uh, there are elements of CFP that have been positive and beneficial. It's not all doom and gloom. I appreciate there are uh, and have been many uh, complexities and problems uh, with it, but it's nice to hear that there are uh, there is consensus among the general objectives around sustainability and ensuring that we have... In, uh, strong industries, but also ones that do uh, take into account uh, the needs of uh, the coastal communities that um, participate in these industries. Um, on the other side of that, however, I wonder if there is, is there any consensus around elements of the CFP that we would be happy to see the back of? Now, Robin mentioned relative stability. Uh, we've briefly touched on landing obligations, quotas, technical regulations, and so on. So. I would generally like to hear if, if anyone has any views on things that the uh, uh, that this does present any opportunities at all uh, in a, in a post-CFP EU era. Thank you, Jamie, for making the question your own. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think a lot of things will go simply through the UK leaving Brexit, uh, sorry, leaving the EU and uh, therefore leaving the common fisheries policy and relative stability will be one of them. Uh, historic access rights, which I don't think we mentioned really before to the 12 mile zone, that, that will go, I'm sure. Um, uh, otherwise, I, yes, you caught me, caught me rather on the, on the hop on this, so I'll, I'll leave others who've got stronger views. If we work back the way, uh, maybe, maybe Scott, if you've got anything or do you want to to no, okay I, looks don't really like we're any working around regardless. michael is looking the other way so it's definitely bertie thank you very much you may have heard the phrase sea of opportunity where we have been defining uh the opportunities that 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 uh, come from this and robin put his finger on it it's the uh the uh, remove away from relative stability and the gaining of sovereignty and governance in our ways will produce a gigantic game-changing opportunity for uh, the seafood industry of Scotland, indeed of the UK, uh, where we can uh, behave on the, on, on the world stage in the same sort of way that, for, for example, Norway does. So there are a number of, of, of opportunities. And that increased economic volume, all other things flow from that. If you've got an increased activity, then, then the jobs can be made more attractive, you would hope, uh, um, and, and, uh, and our reputation would grow. So there's. There's, there's a stream of opportunity from additional economic activity which will fall our way unless, unless it's deliberately uh, uh, traded away or this is handled badly. Uh, Mari, did you, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, yeah, I did. Well, it was just about quota hopping and on the back of some of the questions that we had in the briefing this morning about quotas, and I thought that was you know, developing into quite an interesting topic, and it was just to hear... Um, a, a bit more from Bertie in particular about quota hopping since you responded to that this morning um, and how much is that much of an issue in Scotland is that something that's prevalent here it it certainly exists and, and uh, um, as Wendy uh, as, as, as Wendy said this morning uh, it, it's not actually to do with, uh, with with fishing management it's to do with the right of establishment of a brass plate and about the purchasing of companies yeah. Uh, Land Rover is beneficially owned elsewhere, uh, uh, for instance. Um, so you can you you, you can do that. Um, there there would be an opportunity should the governments of the land decide to change that, if you wish. Norway do it uh, differently, as I mentioned this morning, uh, uh, from f from us. But it's not the central question. We're we're not having our industries bought over in Scotland to any great extent. But it's it's something that we could guard against, recognizing the underlying principle. That, that, that everyone seems to support here and most other countries support is that um, uh, your, your national resource of, of fish is, is indeed a national resource and something that you do not 
completely privatized. Like, you know, you, it's not like buying steel for car making. It's, it's, it's different because it's a national resource. And we can strengthen that or loosen it as, as, as desired uh, um, post-Brexit. The, the unique opportunity exists post-Brexit to do that in whatever way the government decides. Stuart wants to come in. We're, we're getting a queue of people now, so Stuart. Uh, it's a relatively small point. It's back to uh, the point I raised earlier about uh, decision-making and policy-making. Um, that I understand when the Norwegians are sitting down to negotiate with the EU, the fishermen are there as part of the delegation. In the EU, it's the politicians and the officials who are there, not the fishermen. And I, I wonder whether there is not a, an opportunity to have the people, A, who are affected by the decisions directly as part of the negotiating team, but B, who also can inform officials and in particular politicians who are rarely experts in anything. Even if we come to Parliament as an expert, our expertise atrophies and, and disappears. And I, I, I just wonder whether uh, in... Uh, a, a, looking at EU policy, that that's a key area where we can uh, draw more people with relevant knowledge and experience uh, to the table and get better outcomes. I, I'm, I'm just going to bring John in because I think there's a two-fold question here and then okay. just because we're starting to stack up a wee bit. Okay, thanks. Uh, I mean, it was based on what Bertie Armstrong just said. I mean, he paints the picture of, uh, you know, we could just take all the powers back on board. I mean, I think the assumption is that the UK government's going to say, well, we want to get a special deal for the financial sector in London, so we'll give away part of the fishing, eh, because that doesn't really matter to the UK. So, I mean, within the EU policy, are there bits that you would want to keep and bits that you'd be more happy, ha you know, that you just accept that the UK will trade them away? Um, there's two separate questions there. One of the, 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 the potential for the UK to trade it away. We will react as, as savagely as we can manage to anybody any government of any colour trading away uh, 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 what, what we regard as, as, a, as literally once in a generation uh, um, opportunity to take charge of our own national resource. So that's, that's really the central point of that. I, 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 I'm hoping nobody's going to sell us anywhere. I think, I think we've got to be careful uh, about talking about things that are being suggested yes. that aren't actually fact. Yes. And, and, and I think that, that, that what we've got to be careful of is to, is to take cognizance of the fact that, that there's a, there is a, I think, once in a generation was your, your expression, um, although I'm sure I've heard that before, about getting an opportunity of making a change, and you're not going to sac sacrifice that for anyone. So maybe we could leave that one there. The second part of it, Stuart, did you have a question? Your question was on the people at the table, sorry. The, 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 we, we've just been to Norway, and in fact, I think DEFRA and Marine Scotland are, as we speak, with the officials in Norway. The, it, it, Stuart exactly describes the situation. Now, it's not the lunatics in charge of the asylum. It, it, it is the relevant subject matter experts uh, are talking to the right decision makers. And, and uh, Norway warned us that, that there's, there's rough and tumble in the room when, 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 when this goes on, but it's if you like, our rough and tumble. You're not one of eight trying to influence uh, uh, um, your politician who then tries to influence a negotiator who decides what he's going to do in the first place. So it's much closer. Uh, the, the relevant expertise is much closer to the decision making and we would be pushing as hard as we can uh, uh, to be the relevant experts are part of the, including scientists, are part of the, uh, the, the, the decision making process. Callum, I'm happy to let you in with a, with a small <laughs> shopping basket. If, if, if that's well, I, I, I was going to say, I don't have a reverse shopping basket mm. of things to remove from at the minute, but if I could just comment uh, from the CFP, but if I could just come, comment on some of the, the points Bertie made, um, not to disagree with them, but just to sort of elaborate very quickly. Um, just absolutely support this idea that stocks are a national resource, can't privatise. And the example we heard this morning of mackerel absolutely exemplifies that, where they spawn off Ireland and are fished off Scotland. Um, we heard about Norway. I'd also like to look at, uh, draw the committee's attention to New Zealand and British Columbia and Canada, where they're uh, very successfully using um, remote electronic monitoring. So that helps to improve fisheries management, and that could help in an area where 
uh, there might be some grumbling around the CFP in terms of the discards ban. So w there's a good report by WWF. I could draw the committee's attention to, to look at um, improvements that could be made in monitoring activity of C at sea and catch in a, uh, a, you know, a socially just way. <laughs> Bring more rather than take away. So I think I'm going to move on and ask okay. Peter to, to, to. He had a point he'd like to make. Uh, just to get back to the, the landing obligation, I, I wonder if, we, if there's a better way we could we could manage that post Brexit. And uh, because there, you know we all want to see this work, but it is to be managed. It is to be sensible and, and, and work within the, the uh, as it is just now the quota system and the, the the worry of choke species. So I just throw that out and see whether there's a better way we can do that. <clears throat> can, I, can I do it very briefly because we're going to come on to yeah. catching and processing. Uh, absolute uh, uh, brevity. The, the, the problem with the CFP uh, landing obligation is that it was politically driven without, with, without proper regard for the practical application. It's a bit like banning road accidents and sitting back dusting your hands and saying it's all done. How, how would you do that? The, the, the Norwegians um, operate a discard ban, which is, which is less worse than, than, than the UK one, and we might take that as a model. It must be done. We must stop this, uh, or we must reduce this as far as physically possible. But the, U, the, the EU model right now is, is preposterously uh, un, unworkable. OK, Alistair, do you want to come in? Um, if there's anything that we, we can retain uh, from the, the CFP, we would like to see, uh, probably Marine Scotland that would be in charge of all this, but we would like to see them look at Article 17, which clearly states that member states shall endeavour to provide incentives to fishing vessels deploying selective fishing gear or using fishing techniques with reduced environmental impact, such as reduced energy consumption or habitat damage. We have to have that in whatever we create. Okay, I think Callum would, would would support you on that, and, and, and I think fishermen would, from from what I've been hearing as well. So I think that's interesting. Uh, the next theme is is to do with coordination. I'm going to say no more in case I steal Richard's Richard's thunder. Richard, <laughs> most of what uh, what I was going to ask actually has already has been answered or suggested, and, and but I'm old enough to remember the Cod Wars. I'm old enough to remember, you know, the uh, British Navy uh, out and, uh, you know, uh, facing other countries. So, you know, and, and with the greatest respect, some of us feel that the Scottish fishing industry has had a bad deal for years and will still get a bad deal, whatever Brexit comes out with. Um, so, and I was, I was interested in a comment that uh, Professor um, Robin Churchill said that as a coastal state, we just retain all fishing areas for ourselves. Should we, or do we have to, or do we want to coordinate domestic fishing policy with neighbours, or do we want to take it back to our own, um, within our own? And sorry, I couldn't make this morning's meeting, but I know from previous meetings I've been on this committee in the last session that Scottish quotas have been bought up by foreign boats. And basically, that would be done away with uh, once uh, once we get, get into Brexit. So do we want to coordinate wo with our neighbours or do we want to keep all our fish, whatever, wherever it was spawned, do we want to keep all our fish for the Scottish fishing industry and for Scottish fishermen? Robin, do you want to, to, to come on that? I think the short answer to that is if we do not coordinate with the EU and Norway, there's a real risk that uh, it'll be every state for itself and the fish will be overfished. E each state will just take it, what it regards as its legitimate share, which probably will be larger. <laughs> when you add the three together, will be more than 100% of what scientists are recommending as the total catch. OK, does uh, anyone else want... Bertie, do you want... In the briefest of, uh, that's absolutely correct. In the, but in, in the briefest of, uh, of statements, it, it, that will not be possible for all stocks. It, it, it will simply not be possible to take the volume of... Uh, of, of, uh, of stocks, other countries take the volume of stocks that they have under relative stability in their own waters. Uh, but uh, yeah, a real and present danger, and of course we'd want to co want, want to coordinate. Yeah. I mean, sorry, John. Yeah. And then Richard, come back. Yeah. Thank you, Park. The other commentators like to pick up on the point that Alistair made about the sustainable um, 
issues in the retention of that particular section. Okay. Um, do, does that <coughs> when, when you build that into your answers, Richard? Do you want to? Yeah, I, I would really like to ask Mr. Mr. Armstrong how how strong does he feel, or how much of um, inclusiveness has as the, the the UK government um, <coughs> in, uh, in including your association or, or or fishermen in general, wherever they are in the UK, in regards to what will happen after Brexit. OK, yes, I, I understand that we will all have to negotiate. We can't go back to the Cod Wars. We can't go back to, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the Navy has not got the ships now um, to get them down the, the Channel or the North Sea or, 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 or whatever. Um, but how much inclusiveness is the UK government asking the Scottish F Fishermen's Federation or the uh, dare I say it, the English Fishermen's Federation to be included in these negotiations? You. Yep. You we, we, we have uh, had meetings with David Jones's department, with Andrea Leadsom twice, and we're meeting her again next week, uh, uh, with um, officials in DEFRA South, ad nauseum with officials North, and with uh, those MSPs who bother themselves most, especially the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary. So we are talking to everyone. We're not getting hard assurances from everybody that your outcome will be as follow. As, as follows, but on the other hand, we are not getting ignored, and, 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 and as I said earlier, we will react as savagely as we possibly can to this opportunity not being taken. The, the figures are really stark. Uh, the, the, there's a zonal attachment uh, uh, paper, w what fish live here, and, and what proportion of them live here, and what proportion do you catch. I pick out one example, herring. 88% of the herring basically live in our waters in the Northern Continental Shelf. That's a very general statistic. We get 15% of the TAC. So we'd like that to change. And there's a, there's a, a list of 17 in this study w w taken from the uh, of, of official figures where a, a, a grand long period of disadvantage needs, needs to be settled. Of course in coordination, but there must be a robust approach to this. Uh, uh, you, you don't leave the golf club and continue to pay the fees. Uh, the point that Robin r really made very well is that it cuts both ways. Uh, if, if we've left the con control of, of the EU, we want some of this back. Callum, did you want to uh, uh, maybe answer John's question on conservation? Uh, uh, did you want to say something there or not? <clears throat> I'd have to be reminded of that. So I was, I was John, you, uh, you, do you want well, to Well, it was an issue that Alistair raised when asked about what would be worthy yes. of retention, and it was about using sustainable methods uh, and uh, the, the low carbon impact that, that they would have. I'd, I'd hope to maybe hear from Mr Armstrong on that. because Well, perfect. But if you'd like to answer, and, and maybe you, Callum, will get a chance to gather your thoughts to, to come in with a short answer. Um, gear development to use less fuel, to have less impact, and, uh, and, and to catch less of that which you don't want to catch is, is, is a moving picture. We, we apply a lot of time, effort, and money to it, and, and we, I would see a redoubling of, of, of efforts to do that under our own management rather than a, a cessation of it. I think there's... Callum, do you want to come in briefly? Because I'd like to move on to the next theme, if I may. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I said answered earlier a lot of the things worth retaining, and, 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 and definitely the, the uh, approach articles four and seventeen provide for ecosystem-based management and transparent objectives, uh, the deep sea ecosystem regime as well. And just very briefly to answer Richard, as also said earlier, of course, we would support a regionalised ecoregion management approach. We need to collaborate and. Uh, whilst not perfect, we, the, the advisory councils for the North Sea and North West waters are a good start. Um, so we, we need to collaborate, and for the reasons Robin said as well, to pre preserve sta straddling stocks. OK, maybe we can move on to the next theme, if we may, and uh, it's to do with uh, the product. So I'd ask Rhoda to, to lead on that one. Yes, it's, it's kind of coming away from... Um, the common fisheries policy but going into trade. A lot of our fish caught is sold um, to the EU as well as a lot of our processed fish going to the EU. What impact is that going to have on us? What, what outcome would people want to make sure that it's fine having all, all the opportunity to fish, but if you don't have somewhere to sell it, then that becomes a huge difficulty for the industry. So how do we overcome that and how do we negotiate? 
So maybe we could bring Michael in to start on that one, please. Well, to answer Rhoda's question, um, where else can the EU get the fish from? Um, you know, we're currently exporting quite a lot of, of our product to the EU um, because they, they need it. Um, if we have a greater share of the raw material, um, that means there's a lesser share for the EU vessels to have, which would increase the demand for our product because they're, they're catching less, but they're still consuming those same levels, so they will require that product. So we feel that um, uh, you know, export sales and, and even domestic sales will continue and, if anything, will increase. Um, we are not um, afraid of any changes to, to tariffs because, again, we feel that those will be minimised because of the demand for our product from the EU. Um, they just can't get it anywhere else. You know, where can they get fish from if not from uh, our waters and from our processors if their access is reduced? I'm not saying it will their access will stop, uh, but it will certainly reduce, and they, they require that product. So we're quite confident that this is a, a good opportunity for the processing sector. Come on, Ryder, if you'd like to come back on that. I just want to come back on that, because obviously if there are tariffs in place, that increases the cost. I mean, how elastic is that going into kind of basic supply and demand economics, there must be a point where tariffs would actually affect people's buying power. So there must be, you know, is, that, is there a concern or are you quite confident that no matter what they do within reason, and that one imagines it would all be within reason, um, won't impact on sales? Again, Rhoda, you're quite correct. Um, there would be a limit, of course, to, to that, but um, our feeling is because of the, the demand for the product that any increase in tariff would be as little as possible to avoid making the price of that raw material too high for them. Um, just because we have the product doesn't mean that um, we can demand any price for it. <coughs> But the demand for it is so high and, and strong, very strong, it's very consistent throughout the whole year, that the level of increase, we feel, would be minimal because they value the product. They, they don't want to put such a barrier in place to reduce or to increase the cost of it. They, they still want that product. So we feel that negotiations on tariff will be um, in our favour, so to speak, that whilst there will be a, an increase, it will be offset by the increase in demand for the product. Now, there's a queue of people waiting to come in, and Alistair's been waiting the longest. So I'm going to do it in the order that you, that, that, that you revealed your question. So, Alistair first, I have then to I'm agree going to come with, to uh, Scott. I have to agree with much of what Michael said. Uh, the, the, the demand is far, far outstripping the supply in our sector. It's probably the same situation with Michael. And I, I, I can't imagine Europe placing tariffs upon the product that we have, which is second to none on the planet, right? For the sake of giving UK a bloody nose, and they can't do that to our fishermen. And one of the most encouraging things that I've seen through my, my position as national coordinator for the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation is that over the past two years, I've been receiving inquiries from as far as we, away as China for the product that we're actually selling. And in recent times, they've actually developed a railway system that comes all the way from China to France. It takes seven weeks, but nevertheless, they've developed this because they want product from Europe. Now, Scotland, OK, we've got the tunnel now, so we can get all the way to China now. So there's many benefits coming our way, and it would be, be extremely foolish of Europe 
to give us a bloody nose on that one. I, I think there may be some locals that will miss their shellfish if they all disappear. But Scott, you want to to, to come in? Yeah, I mean, we we sort of worst case scenario this uh, with regard to potentially there could be a. a well, what's been described as a hard Brexit, clean Brexit, and we know now from the Prime Minister's uh, statement that they're looking for a clean Brexit. Um, and therefore, on WT, WTO tariff favoured nation status, we would uh, be incurring a 2% tariff on fresh salmon, a 13% tariff on smoked salmon. And so, putting that to one side, I then go and look at the significant fluctuations in the market prices we've had in the last 12 months. So in, 2015 into the European Union, Scottish salmon attained £3.92 a kilo, and in 2016 attained £5.74 a kilo. That's a 46% rise in what we were attaining as market price. So that's a huge uh, variation, a huge increase beneficial to us. And, you know, if you put it in that context, as the background context, the tariff is negligible. Whatever the tariff hap happens to become, it really is negligible. Our biggest challenge is actually producing enough to meet the demand. No matter we've got a major competitor a few, a few hundred miles away across the, the North Sea, that is our biggest challenge. And, and I take on board Alistair's points about uh, safeguarding uh, other species and you know, it's something that we're spending inordinate amounts of money and about to do a lot more uh, to, to help in that situation. And so, you know, that's our big challenge. Our challenge I foresee in, in, in uh, all of this is not about tariffs. It's actually about any potential physical impediments to moving perishable goods quickly to market. We can get uh, fresh Scottish salmon on the white linen tablecloth in Manhattan within 24 hours of harvest. Uh, and we uh, likewise can do that uh, in the European Union as well. But that's on account of the f very free movement, physical movement of, of the fish. So there are no barriers, paper barriers or, you know, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, physical barriers at the marine ports or the airports. And that, to me, is the big challenge. It's not really the tariff. I feel eyes boring into me from all directions. I will try and get round you all. Robin, you were next. Uh. I understand perfectly the, the logic of what Michael is saying. Uh, I just feel that EU practice is not entirely on your side. Uh, it looks as though what we will end up with post-Brexit is a free trade agreement of some kind between the UK and the EU. Uh, most uh, tra free trade agreements that the EU has concluded with other states do not include free trade in fish or agricultural products. Uh, even with Norway, tariffs are payable on imports of uh, many fishery products from Norway into the EU. So uh, uh, I, I'm not, not convinced that the EU is going to necessarily give us a good deal on that. Uh, the other thing I think is, which is very important, is Scott's point about documentation which is that uh, if you export any kind of perishable goods to the EU, you have to comply with EU sanitary standards uh, and have to have the documentation to show that you're complying. As far as the fish, ca fish catching side is concerned, there'll be ha have to be documentation showing that the EU's rules of origin are being complied with as well. So uh, I, I think from a trade point of view, a hard Brexit is a nightmare because it will apart from the tariffs issue, it will increase enormously the amount of documentation required. Stuart, do you want to come in at that stage? I, I Two things. The documentation one has now been covered, so I'll skip that. I, I just wanted to make the general point that probably in tariff terms, uh, fluctuation in currency is a much bigger influence on the amount of money that the industry can make. And currently that's the, the bigger and more difficult to manage threat. So that was it, Camilla. Scott, I, I, I agree with you, Stuart. Uh, but the currency against the, Euro, against the euro was, say, 12, 15 percent movement, but 46, you know, that's a, oh, sure. a quarter of that. You know, it's, it's the dynamics of the market really is the driver. I was, I was going to say, Scott, I'll come back to you in a Sorry, minute, but you sort of jumped the gun. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll let you away with it on this occasion because Alistair yeah. was waiting. Yeah. Alistair. Robin actually alluded to it was the documentation and the hoops that we might have to jump through might be another way of getting us. You know? So documentation, documentation is proving a, a grave concern. Bertie. Last little thought. Um, 
It, we, we must not imagine that the single market or the, the Europe is the only market in the world. 33 countries, 400 million people. Yep. Oh, there's there's another 178 of them out there, with uh, with 7.5 billion people in it. Um, when the Russian sanctions were applied, uh, and we lost the the pelagic fish market, we were able, in fairly short order, to reset that fish to other markets in the and opened up a market in the Far East, which has been very good thus far. Um, and uh, and to Africa for the lower quality, lower priced fish. Um, therefore, there is another world out there which will be open t to us, and we shouldn't forget that. <coughs> okay, uh, Michael, did you want to come in? I, I've sort of lost track. There were so many hands flying up and down. Yes, thank you, Edward. M my uh, point was to latch on to something that Scott said that um, th there's, you know, a lot of our members are keen to expand their business to take advantage of increased orders but are just holding back obviously because of the uncertainty of what's going to happen but once everybody knows what we're faced with and all agreements have been reached um, our sector's looking to, to move ahead and, and expand. Jamie, you, you'd indicated you wanted to come in as just well. Just an observation uh, really, I mean the whole point of tariffs, taking it right back to the fundamental, you know, uh, rationale behind them, sh surely uh, originally was to stop importing produce competing with locally produced products. Therefore, tariffs would uh, try and stabilise those markets. In, in the instances of salmon, for example, they were selling into countries which have neither the ability nor the desire to produce those products. So there's always <coughs> going to be, and I'm really glad to hear that Bertie thinks there is a worldwide demand for our products outside of the, the EU single market. But I was really intrigued by Scott's point about it isn't just about tariffs, it's actually about more, some of the more logistical barriers that might, might be in place that would prevent <clears throat> these markets flourish. So I think that's something maybe, you know, from a political point of view, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that it's not just about contracts uh, and, 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 and financial tariffs, it's actually about the physical logistics, and that's something I certainly will take away from this meeting. Thank you. Scott, you you jumped the gun, uh, but do you want to go back to something you were going to say earlier, or are you or, uh, or are you happy? Yes. Does, can I ask if there's any other? Uh, Callum, sorry, I know you wanted to come in. Just yeah. a quick point. I appreciate this talk, this se session is mainly about export, but just to take the opportunity to uh, remember uh, or emphasise the uh, potential for shortening supply chains as well, and keeping good, high quality produce and growing the markets for those within Scotland and the UK as well in terms of uh, um, opportunities ir ir and things to incentivise irrespective of constitutional arrangements. John wants to come in and, and Michael wants to come in on the back. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, there, there seems to be a, a bit of a contradiction with, uh, you know, certainly my position of supporting Alistair earlier about sustainable and then talking about transporting food halfway around the world. So um, I, I think it is about trying to maximise uh, local production and consumption. Okay. Michael, you want to come in? Yeah. I totally agree with the, the point that Callum made and, and backed up there by John that um, this is an opportunity that could work in our favour to reduce the, the imports of fish, which would in turn uh, increase the demand for local fish to be used throughout the country. Um, it, it, it's ironic that we export 80% of what we catch and 80% of what we eat is imported. Um, this would be an ideal opportunity to uh, try and redress the balance to minimise imports which would be offset by the increased uh, availability of raw material from the catching sector which the processing sector could handle and for those that can't export, whether it's to Europe or wider afield, the opportunities to increase sales within the UK would be welcomed by all sectors. Sorry, to Michael, give the value of these two eighty percent if he has them. No, I don't, Stuart. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to come to Alistair, but uh, we're, we're coming to the end of this session, and I think it's fair to give. Uh, uh, the people who've been kind enough to give us evidence uh, that there are two questions coming your way, so you might want to gather your thoughts to them while Alistair is, is, is giving his thoughts. Uh, and one is a very simple one, is, is to ask, 
are there any other implications for your sectors which you haven't had a chance to bring up during the course of this evidence session? And then a, a final point is to ask you for one point that needs to be done now to prepare for leaving for the EU. So those are the two questions in conclusion. I will ask other members around the table before we come to those if they've got questions they want to ask, but I'll ask Alistair to give a... a I'd like to go back to John regarding the supply chain and how far you, your product travels. It was only a couple of years ago that we had Fish and Chip Shop of the Year awards and Seafish, the body responsible for looking after the interests of the, the fishermen who prosecute their fishery in the North Sea, actually went abroad to pick up the fish for the purpose of the Scottish Fish, Chop, fish Shop of the Year award. Michael, I'll let you come back on that. I, I don't want it to be a... a <laughs> I was on Russia TV with that one. <laughs> Mike, Michael, you're going to say uh, about product here. Yes, the, um, that um, Fish and Chip Award is actually sponsored by Norway. Yes. Uh, I, I see this is going to delve into areas which we're never going to get to the bottom of. But we could quite easily... Uh, yeah. Okay, I think everyone round the table will say that the fish produced in Scotland is excellent fish and caught by Scottish fishermen is excellent as well. So can I ask members, just before we ask each of those who've given evidence, if there's any other questions that members would like to ask? Uh, on, sorry, Mike. I asked in the chamber Mike Russell, the Minister for Brexit, yesterday what the policy of the Scottish Government was uh, about um, full membership of the European Union. And Mike Russell's response in the chamber yesterday was that the Scottish Government's aim is to have full membership of the European Union. So there could be a scenario where there could be a scenario where we leave the European Union and after a referendum we come back into the European Union. I wondered whether anybody had any thoughts about that. I think we get my, I understand your question. I wonder if that may be one better to left hanging um, at the moment because that may open up a whole lot more. Maybe, John, John, you had a different question, I think. Yes, I mean, my question would be um, if, in Bertie Armstrong's perfect world, we do have a huge increase in our catch, will, will that be spread around amongst more vessels and more owners, or would it just make the existing, what I, I think are quite a small number of big ships, a lot richer? Very good question. We, we wrote specifically uh, as part of our suite of evidence for, for this whole issue uh, an, 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 an inshore paper, and it would be uh, perverse if we just ended up with the, the, the present catchers swelling. It, that, that, that doesn't work. There is an opportunity here to spread the largesse or to uh, spread the opportunity much further, <laughs> and, and, and we're committed to do that. Okay, perfect. Um, I think. I am going to leave it there and, and ask if I may ask the witnesses then if the and, and maybe we could start with you, Scott. Is there anything that we, we haven't you haven't raised? And, and would you give us one thing that, that you believe needs to be done uh, to prepare now for leaving sure. the EU? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the one thing I think, uh, if, if the UK government, being the negotiating government, can uh, get early agreement on the security of EU migrants. I think that would be an early thing, that, and I think there's certainly pressure in, in the public domain about that. Um, whether they've got any control over that, it seems to me that the EU itself is being recalcitrant on that point, but I think that's that's something that would be helpful for, uh, for all of us. Uh, the, the only other thing is, is um, in, that, in our paper, we, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Scottish Government paper, uh, which reads well, our Scotland's place in Europe, um, you know, seeks a differentiated solution, and now we know that uh, if it doesn't get one, there's obviously going to be another referendum. Um, and I don't want to get political here, but I, I do need to make the point, because I've been uh, instructed that we must make the point. The UK market is absolutely crucial to our future in Scottish farm salmon, and we need to do all we can to ensure that there are no impediments to trade within that market for the forever, basically. Okay, uh, Michael, I'm ha uh, so, sorry, Scott. I'm happy for you to leave it there. Michael, would, would you like to to say something? Thank you, Edward. Um, I would say the one thing that we would like um, to be made 
now, so to speak, would be the guarantee of, of the EU nationals that are already here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that would be for any industry, not just the fish processing sector, but for any industry in, in, in our country that's reliant on the EU nationals. Uh, it's vital for them. We, we can't replace them. And uh, other implications? Uh, well, we've, we've touched on uh, all the points I had, the tariff, single market access, sustainability, investment, employment, but uh, there's now the double uncertainty. We, we came uh, up until last Friday thinking about what's Brexit going to do for us, and before we know what Brexit's going to do for us, we, we now have this political um, uncertainty, shall we say, about what Scotland wants to do. Um, Personally, you know, we would have rather have had Brexit dealt with and out of it, seen where the country was, and then dealt with the second question. But, okay. um, Bertie. Uh, in the briefest possible terms. Uh, the, the, the implication is there, but n not the statement, that the balance of benefit from uh, Brexit, from the sea of opportunity, uh, far outweighs the challenges that are coming our way. And it's just worth saying that, that we regard this whole thing as perhaps the, one of the bright spots. Um, the, the one point that we would make uh, uh, is, is that, that we, we make a plea to both governments to work together to make absolutely certain that under any constitutional arrangement that we do not end up back inside the common fisheries policy. Because to borrow a phrase from our Norwegian friends, which we were very taken with yesterday, um, if this is well handled, it will keep the lights on in, in, in coastal communities uh, uh, around the whole of the United Kingdom, which wouldn't be uh, kept on otherwise. Alistair. I agree with uh, the latter part of Bertie's statement there. We must keep the lights on in rural communities around our coastlines. Furthermore, I think we've got to try and look at this as an opportunity, and if we look at it as an opportunity, it might be an opportunity to bring more of our own folk back into the industry from where we've lost, villages, etc. That's the ethos under which we work. Callum, I'm, I'm nervous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on your list. <laughs> uh, two quick things I didn't mention in terms of implications. Bycatch, so uh, it's important that whatever arrangements we have effectively address bycatch of marine birds, marine mammals, basking sharks, turtles. Um, we, as part of the, the spatial measures that we think can deliver more benefit and more can be done using them um, uh, to meet environmental criteria, functional unit management should be looked at. So looking at the actual grounds that fish and shellfish associate with. And the point that needs to be done now before leaving the EU to echo Bertie and Alistair, uh, it's about all, all four administrations working together, including Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, the Joint Ministerial Council is a place where that uh, could and should be happening. And the, the, they, they work together in order to come up with uh, governance and management arrangements that are compliant with Aarhus the Aarhus Convention, irrespective of constitutional arrangements, and that delivers socially just fishing within environmental limits. OK. And Thank environmentally just. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, Robin, if I could ask you to... to Thank you. Uh, well, I'm really here in a personal capacity, so I don't represent any sector. Uh, but one thing I would stress, which I don't think we've said a lot about this morning, is the importance of having a management authority or management authorities in place on day one of Brexit that are well staffed, uh, equipped with the necessary expertise. Uh, and at the moment, it seems to be to me to be un rather unclear as to where this is, whether there's going to, what the relationship will be between a UK authority and the devolved administrations. But we really have to have this sorted out be before day one of Brexit. And I also agree with what, uh, very much with what Callum has said about sustainability. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I thank everyone who came to the committee to this morning? I think you've, you've left us with food for thought and, and things to think about. Um, it, it's been, I think, a very productive meeting, and I, and I thank you for engaging with us. I'm sure during the course of this uh, committee's uh, remit, we may be coming back to you to ask for further information. 
but on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to now briefly, sus briefly suspend the meeting uh, to allow you to, to, to go in the committee to reorganise for the next session. Thank you.
And I'd like to move to agenda item two, uh, which is on seatbelts on School Transport Scotland Bill. On Wednesday, the 8th of March, the Parliament agreed that the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee should be the designated as the lead committee in consideration of the seatbelts on School Transport Scotland Bill at stage one. This is a member's bill introduced by Gillian Martin and supported by the Scottish Government. To begin the committee's scrutiny of the bill, we'd like to take evidence from the Scottish Government officials who are providing support to the member in charge of the bill. And I'd welcome uh, Brendan Rooney and Kenneth Hannaway uh, and would ask if one of you would like to make an opening statement on the bill um, and then we'd like to move on to questions. So who, who would like to make an opening? Yes, yeah, that'd be me. Morning, convener and uh, members. Thanks for, for having us today. Um, yes, I'll just set out some opening remarks to give you the kind of wider context and, and how we've got to the position we're in, um, and then happy to take questions. Um, safety on the journey to and from school is something that the Scottish Government um, obviously takes as, as a matter of pivotal importance. Uh, it's borne out uh, in a range of measures taken nationally um, to keep pupils safe, not just within motor vehicles, but also in relation to youngsters walking or cycling to school. Um, given the safety benefits of seatbelts are well established um, and internationally recognised, the proposals in this bill are seen to make a valuable contribution to those wider aims. Uh, the development of these legislative proposals have some history to them um, and are not new to Parliament. Uh, they emanate from considerations by the Public Petitions Committee some years ago. Uh, Scottish ministers subsequently stated their intention to act um, and power was devolved via Section 30 order during the previous parliamentary session. The bill follows the introduction of similar measures in Wales after a comparable devolution instrument. Uh, given that the intention to legislate was announced in 2014, uh, it has allowed a substantial amount of engagement uh, with stakeholders and parties involved in the delivery of uh, dedicated school transport. Uh, as such, there's been a collaborative approach to the proposals that are before you. Uh, central to all this has been the Seatbelts on School Transport Working Group, which includes key partners such as local government, the bus industry, parenting groups, regional transport partnerships. Um, additionally, a thorough exercise has been undertaken in partnership with COSLA and the Scottish Local Government Partnership in order to forecast the cost implications of the policy which are set out in detail in the financial memorandum which has been submitted to committee. Uh, the Scottish Government has welcomed the partnership working um, and the contribution of local government to, to these endeavours. Uh, what's clear from the engagement is that there's a very varied picture nationally regarding dedicated school transport. Uh, this ranges from double-decker buses transporting pupils in busy urban settings to single-decker coaches taking youngsters to school on rural A roads. Uh, for councils, such provision is linked to statutory duties regarding the distances pupils live from their school within the Education Scotland Act 1980. Grant aided and independent schools align their provision uh, with their own policies. Local authority provision is overwhelmingly delivered via contracts with private bus operators. Uh, these vary in size, scope and specification and can be quite different across the country depending on a council's needs. Um, a local authority can stipulate various measures within a contract, such as uh, the standard of a vehicle or onboard features like CCTV, Wi-Fi or indeed seatbelts. Um, councils are increasingly writing seatbelts into these contracts. Um, recent returns show 18 do so on all dedicated transport, school transport already. And the bill aims for this practice to become universal as a matter of law. Um, it will apply to all dedicated transport vehicles, such as buses, coaches, minibuses and taxis, uh, including those owned by local authorities um, and school providers. Dedicated school transport is quite distinct from the public bus service, uh, which some councils do use to meet their statutory duties by giving pupils uh, season tickets or paying for individual journeys. Um, extending these legislative measures to that provision would be out with the scope of powers devolved to Holyrood on the issue. The Bill's proposals don't mandate specific measures to be taken in respect of individual vehicles, such as whether retrofitting existing buses or coaches with seatbelts, or for a private operator to renew their fleet or reorder their fleet. Uh, such decisions will be for private bus companies, um, and the, the industry regularly shows flexibility and adaptability to meet shifting contractual considerations. Um, the grant-aided and independent school sector report that their dedicated to school transport is is almost universally provided with seatbelts at present. 
Um, also existing UK law means since 2001, all new buses and coaches on UK roads that are not designed for uh, what's classed as urban use have to have seatbelts fitted. Therefore, older vehicles that are taken off the road through wear and tear are just generally, you know, retired from the fleet, and the ones that replace them are more likely to have belts fitted in, in future. Um, additionally, with regard to young people with additional support needs, or those who might, may need adjustable straps due to the height of the, of the, the youngster, uh, the Bill's provisions have been drafted to allow for this. Uh, the statutory definition of seat belt, which is used, aligns with UK laws, which stipulate that special belts or restraints can be used in place for instance, where a young person has mobility issues or maybe in a wheelchair. Uh, the law on seatbelt wearing and dedicated school transport remains a reserved matter. However, the bill represents an opportunity to promote uh, successful approaches and wider awareness of the issue. Uh, councils and schools use a variety of methods to regulate behaviour on school buses and to encourage seatbelt wearing. Um, and 18 have obviously already, already implemented um, the measures that will be in the bill. Um, Extensive dialogues taking place with local government, parenting groups and other stakeholders um, and this will continue to, in order that we produce non-statutory guidance that will help um, promote good practice around seatbelt wearing um, that goes alongside any final act. Um, the Scottish Government conducted a three-month public consultation on the proposals last year. Uh, the analysis is before committee for consideration. This garnered um, Feedback from organisations and people across civic society, such as parents and schools, uh, with respondees overwhelmingly stating it would be a useful contribution to road safety. Uh, thanks, and we welcome any questions you, you have. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, I think the first question is coming from Stuart. Uh, I, I want to ask just a couple of questions about uh, why the bill and why the government supports the bill. And to, to underpin that, uh, can you tell us how many children are injured travelling in school transport that would be affected by this legislation? There are actually figures collated um, on the number of school children injured on dedicated school transport. Um, certainly the number of children um, up to 16 um, injured on buses and coaches in Scotland is around 45 a year. Um, that's for all provision, though. That's not dedicated school transport, and it's not possible to extrapolate from the figures the precise numbers on on dedicated school school transport. And of that 45, have you anything you can indicate to the committee as what proportion of that 45 uh, would not have been injured if seatbelts had been available to that child? There's not been an analysis done, done of that. Um, it is worth noting, though, these are children on the bus. If a child had been injured just after disembarking, that would be counted in statistical terms as a pedestrian. So... Uh, yes, in, in, indeed, that's quite a, a, a clearly quite a different issue. Uh, so it, it, it could be as many as 45, but we can expect it to be rather less than that. It's, so let me try and come at it from a slightly different angle. Can you tell us anything about the nature of the injur injuries the 45 suffered? In other words, are they comparatively minor ones or are they significant injuries or a mix? Uh, of those average, um, three are three are on average um, annually were serious, and forty-two were what's deemed as slight in statistical terms. So, right. So, so basically, we've got the statistical underpinnings, and I've had constituents who've been on the case of this bill for a long time, and I've supported them in doing so. Uh, but given the progress that it seems to be being made, and the numbers you're giving us, uh, why is the government supporting this bill? Well, the government's um, stated intention for the legislation does go back um, a number of years um, to the previous administration during the last parliamentary session. Um, I mean, as, as, as it stated at the beginning, I mean, seatbelts are a well-established safety mechanism and, and government feels that they would be a useful contribution to road safety on the, on the school run. I think that's it, Camilla. I think we can, we can take that up with Gillian Martin when yep. she comes in. Uh, I, I've got a, a, a question, if I may, for you. Um, could you just explain to me the, 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 the idea of why it was 2018 for primary schools and 2021 for secondary schools and, and why there was decided to make a differentiation there? Yeah, yeah, I can do. Yes, the, the, the proposal is for the measures to be phased in and to come in, um, the legal obligation to come in in 2018 for primary school uh, vehicles and 2021 for secondary. Um, there has been extensive dialogue with those who deliver the provision, i.e. the bus industry and, and councils. Uh, the transition needed is greater within 
um, the vehicles used for secondary school. More of those aren't currently fitted with seatbelts. Um, so the timescale was arrived at in, in consultation and collaboration with those um, delivering it. To, to accelerate it, um, the feedback we got was that it would, it would put quite significant pressure on councils and the bus industry and could lead to contracts being broken, which may greatly increase costs on, on local government. Okay, I understand that, but uh, one of the questions that Stuart asked you was, was to do with injuries, and uh, you, you indicated that some of the, in, or the injuries recorded, the 45 injuries recorded, of which two were serious, were for people under the age of 16, and you were unable to say whether what split that was. I mean, it might be that more secondary school pupils are, are injured on buses than primary school pupils, and therefore there might be an increased need to, to, to accelerate that. Was that considered when the bill was brought forward? It was considered, yes. Um, I mean, it has been, been looked at. Implementation dates were discussed and, and a sort of range of options. Um, there's obviously a balance to be, to be found there. Um, it is the, the, the safety... Um, sorry, the statistics we have, we can't differentiate between um, okay. secondary and primary, so I can't actually give you the, the split okay. there. Uh, that, again, that may be a, a question that I take forward with Gillian. Uh, John, do you want to come in with us? You've finished your Yes, bit, absolutely, yes. yeah. Um, you said in, when you were speaking earlier that it doesn't cover registered bus services, and I understand that. But am I right in saying it doesn't also cover school trips? And I'd be a little bit puzzled by that. If the children were brought to school with a compliant bus, but were taken to the swimming baths or something without it? Yeah, it, it's correct that the, the bill as drafted at present doesn't cover uh, school trips. School trips are subject to quite stringent and robust risk assessment that, that's done and, and placing duties on what's called the group leader, which in effect is usually a teacher, um, which stipulates seatbelts um, are to be booked on, on the buses that they use. Th there is quite a distinct provision in that home to school transport is organised at sort of local authority level for local authority wide, Whereas a school trip is often a, a teacher booking a bus for their individual class. Um, there is a system in place to, 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 well, there's guidance in place that promotes seatbelts and, and stipulates that they, they should be booked on that. But it's right that the bill's currently drafted doesn't, doesn't cover school trips. Okay. Sorry, can I, can I just push that? Because I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, the guidance for teachers is to book seatbelts. But, but there's no obligation apart from the guidance. I mean, it's not a legal requirement to have seatbelts, is it? Is that what you're saying on school visit? Because I think that parents would find that difficult to understand the, the, the split between the two, which is the point John's making. Yes, I mean, that's right. There isn't a legal obligation on um, teachers to, to, or group leaders to, to ensure seatbelts are. I mean, in practice, it's, it's universally... Um, feedback is that it's, it's, it's universally done and the guidance is very well adhered to, but uh, that's correct, the, the bill is drafted, doesn't cover that provision. Okay, um, Mike, do you want to come in on that? Edward's line of questioning on this. Is, just explain to me, would you please, is, is it a devolved power to legislate to ensure that school trips um, use seatbelts where they are provided? Is that, a leg is that devolved to us or not? Is that a, U is that a UK legislative authority? No, that, that is devolved. You know, that so is we could it's do it now? We could do it in this bill? Technically, I believe. OK, yes. thank you. An amendment, perhaps. OK, maybe, maybe we can consider that further. Um, Richard, the next question was from you. Good morning. Um, as a grandfather, I could take my grandkids to school. Uh, I have to have two... Seats in the back with seat belts, and I've got to ensure that they're, they're well uh, fastened in. But yet yeah, we still have 18. Uh, we have 18 uh, local authorities who already require all dedicated uh, transport to be fitted with seat belts. Uh, we've got 32 councils, so 14 of them are not, and a further six who are requiring some contracts that um, as services for primary school pupils or a particular type of vehicle uh, that they need seat belts. You made an interesting comment about the factor of new buses coming on, but there's still 110 buses which have not been fitted by with seat belts. And I would contend that, with the greatest respect, most of these buses are quite old. Uh, if you look at the, the buses that are going about and uh, spewing out their diesel as they go along the road, 
Um, fumes, you'll be interested in that, John, I suppose. Um, but basically, this, the situation is, why have these other authorities, and it, it, this has not been on the go for the last couple of years, this has been on the go for a number of years. Why have the other authorities totally not uh, insisting that we have seatbelts on these buses? Is it because the people who have tendered still have buses which are ancient and they don't want to spend the money to um, bring them up to standard? Or is it a case of not insisting that they've got to change them and get, them, get it sorted? Yeah, there's a couple of points there. I think it's, it's a variety of issues from council to council. Um, certainly, I think it is a fair assumption that, that some of these buses will be older vehicles. Um, when I said at the beginning, since 2001, there is a, as I said, any new bus that that's, that's, um, comes onto the UK road would have to have seatbelts fitted unless it's designed for urban use. So that means double-deckers essentially are, are designed for urban use. Um, and if it has standing room, so you'll see single-deckers used on commercial bus services that, that don't have seatbelts fitted. And it's the stipulation around um, having standing room, which means it's designed for urban use. So larger coaches that are often used in more rural authorities, um, given the, the faster roads and uh, the more rural environment, are, are more likely to um, already adhere to those, those wider UK laws. It's certainly fair to say that councils have also been increasingly doing this since the ministerial announcement was made in 2014. So there has been, over recent years, an increased number doing it in, in preparation for the legislation. Um, given that we knew powers were being devolved via Section 30 order, there was a, a, a good amount of time to engage with councils in the bus industry to, to help them get ready for this and, and make the transition. And that, that has been borne out in the feedback we've had that it's, it's increasingly happening in the run-up to to legislative measures. You're basically saying that the, the, the buses that have been fitted in rural are being fitted in rural areas and uh, council areas and council authorities in that area. But uh, one area I'm particularly interested in, because it is near my, my area, um, it falls within the Glasgow, um, sort of South Ayrshire, East Renfrewshire, uh, Western Bartonshire area, it comes under the SPT, uh, Strathclyde Passenger Transport. Why is it heavily that they don't have seatbelts fitted? Is it something that is uh, particularly averse in the SPT area? I mean, I, I don't know if the committee will take evidence from SPT. Certainly they contract for a number of local authorities in the west of Scotland and so do run quite an extensive um, number of contracts with various bus operators. Feedback from SPT to us is that they're increasingly writing in the um, seatbelt stipulation as it, we move towards legislation. Um, I can't say categorically the decisions they make on individual contracts. Um, I mean, the, you know, as, as with any other local authority or regional transport partnership, the, the option is there for them to write seatbelts in. Um, it, it may well de it, it depend on provision in the area and, and you know, what bus operators are offering, but I, I can't vouch for the decisions that, that they would personally make. The implications of the bill will what, what will that mean for the SPT? You know, is it a case that SPT are pushing the, the operators or not, or not pushing the operators because they don't want to rock the boat? Or is it a case that the contra as the contracts come up and, and are renewed, that then they can turn around and say, we, we, you need to put in seatbelts? Yes, I think it would be done when contracts are renewed rather than part way through a contract, as that could be quite difficult to, to, to change the, the terms of a contract midway through. Um, it's certainly fair to say feedback to, to the Scottish Government has been that, that SPT are increasingly writing this into contracts and, it, and it, they are phasing this in as, as it progresses towards legislation. As I say, they do have a wide number of, of contracts for various local authorities, so my understanding is that they don't categorically do it on all of them at the moment, but they are increasingly moving towards it. Thanks very much, Kevin. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, Mike, Mike, I think you've got some questions on enforcement. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, can I just first of all say I'm, I'm, I think it's an absolutely right idea that we have seatbelts in schools. The point of the committee's work now is to interrogate the bill and to see whether actually the bill is fit for purpose for the process. Um, and my questions really focus on enforcement. I mean. I, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, if we pass this bill and therefore we require school transport to have seatbelts, 
we're not requiring them to be used. Is that right? To be worn, you mean? Yeah. Well, that that's that's a reserve. That is a, a still a reserved issue. So there aren't actually powers out. So we can't legislate power. for that. Not to to put a duty on. But a when driver. I asked you just now whether we could legislate for school trips for people to use this, you said we did have the power. Oh, sorry. That's perhaps my um, perhaps not been clear. Not we can't legislate on any um, provision for for the wearing of seat belts, but we couldn't. You, legislation could be passed to. So, to right, mean they so have not to be on school trips on. either. Then. Not on school trips either. Not on school right. trips. Okay, either, no, I sorry. got that clear that now. Well. Okay. So th my question, therefore, is if we can't enforce this, if we pass this law, and it, so the law is purely about getting the things fitted. Is this the right way to go about it? I mean, has the, my question is, has the Scottish government, I think everybody's supportive of this process, has the Scottish government asked the UK government to use the legislative power it has to put a bill through that would allow both fitting and the enforcement of the use? Has that question been asked by the Scottish government? To my knowledge, um, it, 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 it hasn't. Um, I could I could write to committee with some further. I, I'm not certain. I, I my thought is that it hasn't, but I think there may well be a reluctance to to devolve beyond the. the no, scope no, I'm of not what, talking what's about devolving. I'm asking whether the Scottish government has asked the UK government to legislate for this because what I'm fearful of are we spend time in this committee in the parliament passing this legislation, which I want to see effective. We have a big tick in the box. Oh, job done, and then when we find kids are still being injured. So I really want whoever does it to have the, the best solution. And I just wanted to check. It would be very helpful if you could let the committee know in writing, therefore, to the convener, um, whether the Scottish Government has asked the UK Government to do this so we don't go off half cock, as it were. Brendan, could you, could you just clarify, is it le a legal requirement to wear a seatbelt on a bus in the United Kingdom? Can you do better? Well, uh, then maybe it comes back uh, convenient to Mr. Uh, Rumble's point. Um, the wearing of seatbelts is a fairly intricate, uh, as you might imagine, a set of uh, statutory provisions that, that cover that. Um, the short answer to your question is no. Um, there are uh, various exceptions, exemptions. I think, Brendan, one of the examples is actually children under 14 and particular types of vehicle coaches. Um, although that is something that I think um, the, uh, there's an EU directive which has not yet been implemented by the EFT, but is under consideration. So there's a kind of there's a framework, um, and you know it's not universally applicable. Uh, but I can maybe just help clarify as well the point. I don't, I don't know if it was adequately clarified or not um, for Mr. Rumbles, but the sort of question as to what's reserved devolved. Um, I think I took from your earlier point, um, it was more about the question of we're doing a particular thing with this bill in relation to effectively school transport uh, from and to, uh, between home and school, uh, which is right. And I think your question was, um, could that be widened out uh, to school trips during the day, etc.? Uh, and the answer to that question is yes, because the Section 30 order uh, talks about... Uh, effectively devolves uh, this sort of thing, if I can put it that way, uh, in, in relation to arrangements for persons travelling to and from places where they receive education or training. So, you know, the thing that we're doing here is a specific, you know, category uh, between between home and school, but that could be widened out to school trips. It's not about the actual wearing or enforcement of any. So there's no enforcement. About it's the, the, yes, it's, that's exactly right. It's the, it's the requirement. It's the requirement that. that uh, education authorities will have in their contracts that buses provided, um, used for this type of provision, uh, will have seatbelts fitted. Yeah. I, I understand what you've just told me. Well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at this, if I may, from somebody whose child is on a bus and, and just say something horrific happens and they get injured on the bus. They turn around and they say the Scottish Government made it law that seatbelts had to be fitted on the bus. But there's no requirement of anyone to wear a seatbelt on the bus. So the onus is on the school teachers to make it an acceptable practice to wear the seatbelt on the bus. And therefore, what we're saying is the Scottish Government is saying, fit seatbelts, school teachers have got to encourage children to do it, job done. It doesn't think, I don't think that parents in Scotland 
would would feel that that was right. I wondered if if that's a question we should be asking the minister, or, or, or is, is that your is that your point, Mike? Is it, it is. It, what I, I mean, we've got a whole system of enforcement questions because they're legitimate ones. But what I'm taking from the answers from the from the officials is that actually there is no enforcement about this in legislative terms. We're, 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 this bill, before, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, the, it's only coming to light now. Um, this bill before us is purely about a technical aspect of allow of having seat belts fitted. Um, it's not about any other issue about whether kids are safe travelling to and from school on buses with, with seat belts fitted. And I think if we're going to take legislation through, we should be comprehensive and attack, uh, uh, attack the problem, which we all foresee is there and the potential, rather go off half cock on this, if I can use that expression, um, with a bill that doesn't cover what people's okay. worries, worries uh, are. Can, can I just say, slightly in defence, that I probably jumped the gun by making that comment because we are having two evidence sessions uh, with people, and I think those are the questions we can reasonably ask. Whether it's a, Richard, uh, did, do you just want to on come, the John? point that Kavina just said there? It's not school teachers who will be on a bus at eight o'clock in the morning. It will be the bus driver taking the kids from the farthest away point to the school. So actually, it'll be the bus driver who will need to say to the kids, put your seatbelt on. Now, I don't see the bus driver stopping every two minutes to check to see if people have got their seatbelt on. So, you know, the point that Mr Rumble's made is quite valid and the point the convener's made. So who's going to be liable for enforcement if there is any enforcement? Richard, I'm not sure that, 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 that Just these, these, view, these two view. gentlemen may Just give us the answer, and it's maybe something we could take up. I mean, if you want to give us a short answer to that, is that correct, what he's saying, what Richard is saying? Well, yeah, just very briefly, yes. I mean, the, the legal measures around that on seatbelt wearing are the, the reserve to Westminster and overseen by a sort of EU framework. In terms of what happens in practice, um, the councils have various uh, ways of, me of monitoring and improving behaviour on school buses. Some of them use bus monitors, so it's not always just the driver. Some use prefects or older children who help the youngsters um, put their belts on. Um, we've had a lot of engagement with local government on this, and there seems to be quite innovative measures that do take place. Um, and as I was setting out at the start, we do envisage quite comprehensive guidance that will help look at the best approaches to this, but it is fair to say that legislation on that matter is, is out with the scope of, of the powers that have been devolved that the bill takes forward. John, I think you wanted to make a comment. It's more a comment for me. Uh, Convener, and that is, I mean, the officials have obviously been given charged with doing a job and they're doing it very thoroughly, and um, I sense the frustrations that Mike and indeed yourself have, and it might be appropriate for this committee to seek the devolution of the necessary powers that uh, have caused the frustration here, because... I mean, it's one of a range of frustrations that some of us might have about, but that's presumably is an option that we could. I think, we need to, I think the committee needs to consider whether the, whether the bill is achieving what it's setting out to do, which is safeguarding children, and I think that is the critical thing that we need to consider. Can I ask you? Sorry, John. John wants to come in. I, I I take the point you're you're making, John. On finance. No, okay. uh, no, no uh, sorry. Just on this. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. Okay, a technical one. I'll walk it. Walk, just, walk, just walk to, because you said that um, good practice amongst local authorities is that they have somebody on. Would it be in the powers? Could we could we put an amendment to this to save this bill? Could we put an amendment to the bill, which would put a duty on local authorities to have some sort of person, whatever it is, on the bus to make sure that they can do that? Just a thought. Is that, is that within our powers, yeah, legislative powers? I think we would have to, to write to the committee. Certainly that, that is a different issue from the, the, the Section 30 instrument that devolved power mm -hmm. on fitting of seatbelts. Um, that was something we'd have to, we'd have to look at more widely. <coughs> okay. Uh, uh, Stuart and then Redder, if I may. Uh, <coughs> just to be clear, I, I'm on the same subject, but I want to engage directly in the drafting of the bill. It may be if Rhoda's question might properly proceed mine. If you feel rather yeah, um, my question is about a duty of care, because while there is no legal responsibility, people send their children to school and when they hand them over to the authority, that's uh, local parentis or whatever. The, mm -hmm. If the child was in an accident without wearing their seatbelt, one would imagine the parent would have come back against the authority because they weren't acting in local parentis and they weren't making sure that the child 
was being so under kind of health and safety and negligence legislation there might be a comeback I, I'm happy Brendan that you're, you're looking as though you want to consider that whether whether it, it would be writing back to the committee before we take our evidence session because I think that is a is, is a key question which runs through the themes of, of, of the points that people have made yeah most certainly we'll we'll, okay. we'll take those away and, and Stuart and send them out. Uh, right. Addressing this to officials, because I'm presuming the drafting of the bill lay in your purview. Uh, essentially, of the six uh, sections, there are two active sections, and that's sections one and section four. Uh, and I take that also from the commencement arrangements, which essentially commence those two sections uh, at a later date uh, chosen by ministers. Now, section one is commendably brief, and it says a school authority must ensure must ensure that each motor vehicle, da 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 da, has a seat belt for each passenger seat. That's fine. But section four, on the face of it, appears to introduce some doubt, because it now requires each school authority to provide a compliance statement each year on whether they have done what in section one they must do. And I, I, just, I just wonder, um, whether it, it's, it's something that I'm going to see the answer to in the secondary legislation uh, under transitional transitory saving provisions comes along that will show that the, the, the must element is not immediate but phased. Is, is that a correct hypothesis that I'm bringing forward? Yeah. Yeah, I, think, I think that's right, Mr. Seams, and I think, I think the plan is um, there are the high-level dates. Um, there's, as you say, the Section 1 duty, but there will be uh, an intention that there's the sort of transition, uh, because you, you'll recall that there's, um, I think, no intention at this stage to be uh, requiring authorities to break contracts. Um, so the, the, the nuts and bolts of the transition um, will, I think, uh, come exactly to your point. So, so For the whole point of having Section 4, which, if one were to read simply Section 1, appears to be pointless. Um, the whole point of Section 4 is because we expect it to be phased and therefore we require authorities to produce annual reports uh, so that we can monitor as a parliament what's going on, which leads then to just a modest supplementary question. I presume at some point where all authorities are reporting 100% compliance, we will be able to suspend the requirement in Section 4 rather than forevermore receive reports from authorities that tell us what we already knew. Thank you. I'll just note that, I think. Thank you. It's very helpful. Yep. Um, Good. Thank you. A final question, if I may, uh, relates to uh, finance, and I think John wants to start on that. Yes. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, as I understand it, the financial memorandum, uh, we're talking about £8.92 million as the cost of this. I mean, part of me wonders why there's any cost, because if 18 local authorities have achieved seatbelts on buses, presumably just because gradually the buses have improved, as they would have done with disabled access, if lower emissions, a, a whole lot of improvements on buses generally, why do we feel we have to give MD any money to improve the buses in this regard? Yeah, um, I mean the costs. The the, the costs um, are the knock-on effect on on increased contract costs, essentially local governments outlay. So by putting more stipulations on a contract, it, it generally leads to a cost increase. So, um, so by adding extra stipulations, um, contract costs do go up. Um, that's how the figures have been arrived at. I mean they, they were conducted. It is quite challenging to, to isolate the actual precise cost because there are a range of options that, that would be open to a private bus operator to meet a contract. Um, and so essentially there are, there are forecasts that are based on um, the, the contracting authority councils essentially um, taking a, the, a forecast into the future on, on, on what previous increases have been and, um, and essentially applying that to, to future uh, contracts. So, so they're based on a forecast of, of increased contract costs in, into the future. It is fair to say, as we've discussed, that, that some buses may well go out of service anyway or may not. Um, I mean, the Scottish Government does have um, a, a, an understanding with local government that any what are called new burdens are, are costed and um, 
you know, and, and robustly uh, looked at in financial terms. And that's the exercise that we undertook with local government, which, which has arrived at those, those figures. Um, I mean, well, I suppose two points. Firstly, um, I mean, it would appear to be rewarding the bad authorities who haven't done what they should have done before, and the 18 authorities who presumably have found the money by trimming their library services or something, uh, you know, are, are kind of losing out, it, it would appear. And it means 8.92 million, if my maths is correct, is that 89,000 per bus, if it's 100 buses? Well, as I say, it's, it's not something that's been worked out at a per bus, um, a per bus cost. Um, it's a yearly annual increase. The, the, the distribution of it isn't uh, only to the 18 councils. I mean, COSLES and, and the SLGP do negotiate on behalf of, of all their members, um, and it's, it, it's not something that it would, would have seemed fair that, that councils who had already done this didn't receive some kind of financial recompense for it. So it is the national um, local government figure. It's not um, a breakdown between, between 18. I mean, this, the, the precise distribution of which... Um, is something that's, that's worked out, as, as all local government funding is, um, in negotiation with, with um, local government representative bodies and, and looked at in the, the block sort of grant. So it doesn't, it's not a local authority sort of breakdown council by council. OK, well, I'll leave it at that. But. Uh, I feel that you may be asking this question again at a, an evidence session later. Uh, Rada, do you want to come in on the back of that? Um, how will the additional money be distributed? Because, you know... John's talking about some councils who have got good practice and um, being penalised, but at the same time, the councils who haven't done this have done it maybe because they can't afford to do it. So if the money's going into the normal block grant, then everyone gets a share and some councils will be out of pocket by having to recontract for a higher price. Um, it's kind of, it's fraught with, with I suppose, unfairness because do you penalise one or do you not fully compensate the other? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I suppose it's fair to say that, that um, we are officials from the Transport Department and, and local government financing perhaps isn't something we are immensely immersed in the nuances of. Um, my understanding, though, that is the settlement and distribution. This is looking at local government as a whole. Exactly how much is apportioned to individual local authorities is, is something that is decided at, at a, um, in conjunction with local government and the Scottish Government in, in the round of, of the block settlement. So we're not in a position to, to give a, a detailed breakdown of what money is going where. That, the, the overall costs in the financial memorandum uh, make a forecast on the national figure to local government. Um, there isn't a breakdown of, of what is going at this stage as what is going to, to individual councils. It's, get that as part of the bill consideration because obviously that's going to be one of the things that's going to come to us as, as a committee. But yeah, we'll certainly look at what um, at this stage can be, you know, what we what we can give to committee at this stage that, that uh, and endeavour to give us as much information as we can on how that, that will be in the future distributed. Okay, there's one further question from uh, Richard and he's promised it's going to be a quick one. Thank you, Kenya. Yeah, it will be a quick one. I just can't get, uh, I could never get it when I was a local uh, authority councillor that um, if you want to provide a bus for me to run the school children to there, you should provide the, the seat belts. So why should it be a cost to the council? If the person wants a contract, should it not be a cost to the contractor? I mean, I suppose those are probably things that better directed at councils and private contractors. But certainly, our understanding is stipulating extra uh, measures within a contract leads to increased costs. That there isn't a specific binary sort of unit cost for that, because things like with any contract, things like competition in an area and the amount of provision will mean that in an area um, where there is a lot of competition, those bidding for contracts are more likely to have to be more competitive and, and look at keeping their prices down. But you're stipulating, and someone raised earlier, and I haven't got it right in front of me, but it's going to be a couple of years for primary and then a couple, number of years for secondary. But that time, surely all these contracts should be out of, of, of vogue, and new contracts should come in and we turn around and say, bring your new bus and you can have the contract. It's that simple, isn't it? Richard, I think your point is well made, and... and, and and Chidian, when she comes in, and the other stakeholders that, that come it's in, question, may, be, no. may, be, yeah. may be able to Thank answer you. that. I think um, uh, we'll uh, 
stop that there, if I may. We're going to take two further evidence sessions, uh, which will include uh, Gillian Martin coming in. So I'd like to thank you both uh, for attending the meeting and informing us. There are a few matters which uh, the clerking team will be in contact with you requesting further information, and I'd be grateful if you could let us have those as soon as possible. So I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow you to leave. I would ask members to remain in their seats, if I may. Please. Thank you. Okay, the third item on the agenda is the consideration of two negative instruments as detailed in the agenda. The committee would, I'd ask the committee now to consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on these instruments. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments and there have also been no representation to the committee on the instruments. However, I know there are one or two members of the committee who would like to make comment and I would like to ask John Finney to, to start that, if I may, please. Uh, uh, thanks very much indeed, um, Convener. I'd, I'd like to speak on the inshore fisheries prohibit, prohibition of fishing and fishing methods, Outer Hebrides Order 2017. And, and in particular, I, I, to, to say that it's not my intention to move, to have it annulled, um, um, but I would like to highlight some points in it, which I, I, I think the committee may at some future date wish to pick up on. No one would take objection, I doubt, with the policy objective as outlined there uh, of p the protection of fish stocks. Um, it then goes on to say, and better reflect current fishing practices. And we do know that, um, that there is a blanket um, ban on fishing in some areas. Um, a constituent has been in touch with me um, and, and shared correspondence that the Scottish Government have had with, it, with him in the form of uh, Marine Scotland. Um, and, and if I may quote a couple of passages, please, um, it says, Now, turning to your main concern that a precedent is being set whereby if scallop dredging is prohibited in an area, then diving for scallops may be similarly uh, um, curtailed. And I think when the, the, the term to hear, which even experts tell me is quite uh, complex about overlapping areas of responsibility uh, and um, I'm not going to, 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 to details on that, but... Um, uh, then goes on to say, on your questions of over the proposed benefits of the closure, the amendment will bring diving for scallops into line with current restrictions on dredging for scallops and help to effort, effort, uh, effort in fisher, fisheries. These are two entirely different, um, different uh, situations. One is a sustainable method. One of them is entirely destructive, and, and people need only take a cursory examination online to see video footage of the, the effect of these. Um, so I then come to, to what uh, is in the policy note under the financial effects, where it says, uh, in relation to the business and regulated impact assessment, the policy will better complement current fishing practices I don't accept that, by helping ensure that fish are caught at times that are most suitable for market conditions. Well, I don't think c conservation should be driven by uh, market conditions. And I would ask, what's the situation out with these times? But my principal frustration with this is that um, who will monitor this? Who will police this regime? Because um, unless we have adequate enforcement, and, and it's my understanding that that will be very challenging. We've got a series of maps here. You can see the locations. You can see everything else. Unless there's uh, um, an enforcement, then on day, the last day before closure or the first day of closure, a dredger could go through there, cause immeasurable damage um, that wouldn't be impacted by more sustainable methods like the, the diver. So um, I think there's a, a question of proportionality here. I don't think um, uh, that... Um, is being achieved. If you sense frustration in my voice is that um, I, I, I think there are shortcomings here. I would hope at some future point, and, and I'm aware that I'm not shy at making suggestions for our work programme, but at some point if we looked at this, I think this is going to be an issue following on from uh, um, some of our uh, stuff with Brexit and fishing this morning here. I would like us at some time, at future date to consider what the cumulative impact of these, these various orders are and the, the, the monitoring that will take place to ensure they're complied with, because I'm concerned that what we have here is a big bundle of paper that means nothing except it's affecting those who are actually going about their business in a sustainable way. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Uh, Stuart, did you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, please. Um, one of the things I did was go and uh, look at the uh, consultation responses, of which there were ten, and uh, nine of which have been published. One whatever reason has been, uh, been, been withheld. Um, it's worth making the point, of course, that this is an update to uh, a 30-year-old plan. It is not creating new areas on the map. It is changing the boundaries and changing. So the, the only new area appears to be the Loch Rogue area, um, which is to prohibit static gear fishing for shellfish uh, during three months, uh, and that's designed to help protect the area's shellfish stocks. And certainly, as one reads the detail, that appears to be the intention. And looking at the responses to the consultation, um, while there was arguments on both sides, both in favour uh, and against, I think the, the, the thrust of it was pretty firmly in favour of uh, uh, what the government has brought forward. But I think I absolutely make common cause with John um, that this is a highly complex area, and it is in very particular local areas often quite controversial. Um, my knowledge of that is precisely why I went unusually and read all the consultation responses, which I wouldn't normally do in something like this. And I think it, it is proper at some point that we consider for the work programme um, the general subject of uh, the inshore fisheries, because these are, are small numbers in macroeconomic terms, but hugely economically important to very small and vulnerable communities. So I think it's quite proper that John uh, makes that point. I would not wish to see this impeded. I think it should proceed. Can I, can I make an observation, and then if I may bring, bring in Raider on this, is that I, I rather like you, John, looked at all the maps and tried to equate to, to people on the ground and the effect it would have on individuals uh, as well as to the actual environment. And I find that quite difficult to do. So um, although you might not want me to align myself too closely to you, I probably do in this situation. And, and I think that the one thing that this committee will have the opportunity to do during the course of uh, this session is the government has promised to bring forward a bill on inshore fisheries and I would like to see that us consider this in a lot more detail at that stage. So I, 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 I rather like Stuart, don't want to stop this going ahead and I suspect like you John, but, but I did find it difficult to understand and to make relevant uh, comment on based on the information that was provided. Now I'd like to let Rhoda uh, uh, make a comment and then go to Richard and then and then maybe put this to the committee for a decision. So, Rona. Just very quickly, and for those reasons, um, I asked um, Local Fishermen's Association about this because I didn't know how it would work on the ground and I was told that it was part of the Insure Fisheries Group um, negotiations. They'd worked extensively on this. They were happy with it and felt that this was a good way of decision making because they'd you know, the fishing interest had been involved. So, you know, while I worry about some of the instruments coming towards us, this one seems to have been welcomed to an extent. I mean, not everyone will be happy with all of it, but it seems at least to have been, the decision seemed to have been made based on the needs of the local area and conservation, and I think there's a balance to be struck. Richard, would you like to...? Well, yeah, I, I take connection to the point that John Finney was making, uh, but I noticed Marine Scotland Compliance is responsible for monitoring fishing off, fishery officers have the power, etc. But I also agree that we should be looking in our work programme, at the, especially comments this morning from Alistair Stinkler, National Coordinator, Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation. There's other things that we should be looking at, you know, within... You know, there's a, the big 200-mile uh, away fishing, but there are also f a lot of fishing within the actual uh, country of Scotland. So can, can, I, can I take it from the committee that uh, when we, we need to delve into this more when the inshore fisheries come up and, and there are things that we need to look at, but can I take it, therefore, that on the basis of that, that we don't want to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Is that agreed by the committee? Okay, thank you. That concludes today's meeting. I, I would ask as we're going... Oh. oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, the animal feed order. Sorry, we need to do that as well. Are there any comments on that? Sorry, I apologise. No comment. No comment. Okay.
Thank you, no, but it is, it is technically correct, and I thank you for that. So, so can I just say that we are, the committee has agreed that it does, does not want to make any recommendation in re relation to either of these instruments. Is that agreed? Okay, thank you. I'd like to now suspend the meeting, uh, or close the meeting, sorry. Um,